That's why I always got to wear a hat. You got the you got the like, phones all good. You hear yeah, yeah, I got you good, loud and clear. Jack Miller, everybody, <laughs> finally made it. I know. I'm excited. It's not really finally. I think. Does it feel like a long time? Kind of feels well, like. I remember chatting a to you a few years ago when you were road tripping up, and we just never seemed to. Yeah. Well, me being as useless as I am on the telephone, it's just uh, kind of hard to book an appointment. <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's all good. We're fucking here now. We've made it. Cheers, bro. Cheers to that. I'm excited. We're uh, so this is this is a special day, not just because Jack Miller's on the podcast. It's a special day because it is the Alpine Group slash Gypsy Tales Christmas party. We have uh, Franco joining us for this one as well the great man himself the man himself um, so we're just trying to hook into this podcast because there are festivities to festivities be it's christmas you know that's what we're that's what we're here for <laughs> did to you celebrate find, did you find a bike i've actually found a couple on the internet and the problem well i had one lined up and it was like a 110 for like 600 bucks 2015 model i was what? like stoked on it all done deal last night land off the plane this morning and i'm like uh, you know, can I come around and grab the bike? Oh, bike sold, rah, rah. Oh, what? You're kidding. So now I've got another. There's a JR80 in Gold Coast somewhere. Uh, the people do keep ringing me. That's why I didn't ask you before because oh. I thought it was people, but I was out doing shit and I didn't really want to talk to them. So like, <laughs> Did they oh. know it was you? No. Nah. Oh, okay. That's good then. Generally, like, we do it quite often at home. We buy cars on facebook <laughs> marketplace but i generally always make franco message him oh man there's a good one on there get on there quick <laughs> and yeah. get him to message him so so that it doesn't look dodgy if i'm doing it i feel like you could get like a special jack miller price though mm, that doesn't really work just yet but i'm it, hoping if work. we keep if we keep working at it you know then i should be able to get some deals off marketplace what'd you put in that thing just red bull baby <laughs> um so what was the what was the thinking behind like you had me and maddie in stitches last night what was the <laughs> thinking behind uh buying a bike for this evening well maddie said about burnouts and he's like oh we need to organize bikes i told frank this when we were driving here i'm like man listen we may have to stop at somebody's house on the way and he's like what, what, what do you mean i'm like um uh, i rang maddie and the boys last night and i'm like hey is it okay if i byo motorbike <laughs> Dude, I literally went full out last night <laughs> and I booked, uh, I got my rental car, uh, I got a 12-seater high ace and then I got to the airport this morning, I'm thinking, I can't be picking up a 12-seater high ace, so I said, I'll just get, like I said, he's like, yeah, I said, have I got the high ace booked? And he's like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I, I accidentally pressed the wrong button, can I get a smaller <laughs> car? <laughs> I'm like, no, no, need to, it was me and Frank going to be driving around in a 12-seater high high ace literally windows all the way around look like a uh, like a glass house so i didn't quite need that and plus frank's not allowed in vans anymore especially close to schools <laughs> <laughs> so your line the other day which i thought was pretty special was man i love burnouts i haven't done by myself <laughs> yeah i've done burnouts by myself i mean you're not a true burnout fan unless you do it by yourself and then i think we come on the summer nuts thing right yeah i know and then we talked about summer nuts is that still a possibility i think we need to book it in i reckon if you're down like i, I think so i think it's something we all need to experience i feel like it's like a once. bucket list it thing, is eh? it is for sure. i mean we've done the flat track we've done supercross and then we've done the flat track now we're doing the warehouse christmas party I that'll feel just, like the that'll only just cap thing, it off. Yeah, I feel like that's like the natural What was it, like the 4th of January or something like that? Yeah, it's like the yeah 4th and 5th or something in January. We got that. Easy. <laughs> Motorhome. Maybe a 12-seater high ace. 12-seater <laughs> high ace, you never know. We might even buy something to take there on the way. Dude, that would be the funnest shit ever. Like, just the whole time, just sit, sit on Marketplace the whole time. That's it. There. That's all I do is just get on that Facebook Marketplace and go through all the pieces of crap on there and see what you can get. What's your th like? What's your best Marketplace buy so far? i got a couple at home at the moment. The old girl's a bit off me. i got two of them sitting in the paddock. One's gone. I got a Subaru WRX. What? Yeah, got it heaps cheap. I don't know. <laughs> wait, we wait. were messaging the bloke, <laughs> and we're like, "How it. hot is this thing?" And he's like, <laughs> "What do you mean? It's a it's a good car." Like he couldn't get it. He did not get the thing. But my biggest thing is I just jump in them and drive mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to quit on that one halfway home because as soon as I hit the highway, the lights went out. All the dash lights, everything went out. What? So I'm going through the back roads, like through the bush <laughs> behind the house. <laughs> 
and there's like a bushfire and I had to drive through a bushfire and then the fire is rocking up. I'm thinking, man, I just need to boost it and get home I'm ASAP because the cops are coming WRX. here. Yes, yeah, so I am in a hot car <laughs> going through the bush. Doesn't look sus at all. And then we like, we put the plates, we searched what the plates were. Um, I can't remember exactly what they were off, but they weren't off that car. Oh, so it's just full dodgy. I... Mm. That's not on you, bro. It's not on me, man. I'm just uh, the receiver of stolen goods, right? I mean, it's, it's not really a crime. Nah, but um, I got that. And then we got the best one we had is AU Falcons. Really? Yeah. We had one last year eh? because we did. Uh, it's actually this weekend. So I've sacrificed the demolition derby this weekend. Oh, to really? Come down to come here. down here. Normally it's on Christmas Eve, like the night before Christmas. Yeah. And like it's in. Um, Where's where, that? It's, it's near Home Hill. It's just the other side of Home Hill. You know Home Hill? Yeah, yeah. In the cane paddocks. But then I, I don't know if people have seen my stories, but it is nuts. It's really? like you're driving through the cane paddocks, literally. Like last couple of years, we rented a coaster bus <laughs> and it just filled it full of air skis. And last year, we entered the AU um, in it. But uh, yeah, you just drive through the cane paddocks and then it just turns to like Mad Max sort of enter the Thunderdome sort of shit. No it just goes to like <laughs> mayhem everywhere. They got like one of those big you know like pillows in the water yeah 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 and then the kids are jumping off like a th like climbing up a 30 ton excavator and jumping off the bucket onto the pillow and <laughs> flipping their mates and <laughs> the thing. there's this massive conveyor belt slide like made out of like an old sugar cane crusher or something like that and it's just this big rubber conveyor belt with a ramp like that no shit it is nuts but uh yeah the AU falcon was good so then we bought another one lemon it's sitting in the paddock because my assistant last time i was home decided to bounce it across the paddock and it had a wobbly ball joint so Franco's got to fix it now because it's laid in the paddock with the wheel hanging off. <laughs> Mum's really stoked. What would you do without Franco? Oh. I suppose there's less shit it'd be working, eh? Pretty much. Like, <laughs> there a lot less stuff would be working. <laughs> nah, Frank keeps the wheels on everything, keeps them going. He's, uh, he, he, he looks after us. Yeah, I know, Frank goes man. Yeah, I feel like the old, the old summer. He is king of meth canics. That's what we call it, meth canics, because <laughs> he just doesn't, have, whenever I'm around, he doesn't get to sleep. He's just flat out trying to fix stuff. So, Dude, did, oh, we told you last night about our meth head running. How good was that? Yeah, that's not, <laughs> that was a good effort. <laughs> I was waiting to tell you that story on the podcast. Maddie was fucking hilarious, Just bro. losing it. Yeah, so like for the listeners, we had an altercation with some junkies the other night. <laughs> with Maddie, wait, did you hear this story? He hasn't heard oh, it. Oh, we'll tell it then just for Frank. He, we're like we we're, we're asleep. It's like one o'clock, and then Maddie wakes me up, and he's like, "Dude, someone's breaking into the fucking van." And I was like, I was out of it, dude, like deep sleep. And I just got up and I run down the stairs. And his house right now is like you remember the house in Fight Club? Yeah, just like janky as fuck. Like it's so ghetto. <laughs> just bike. like nothing works. Like you have to use keys. Like it's all padlocks to unlock everything. Like there's no door handles. So These I'm are just safe. like, I got up and just bolted down the stairs, pitch black, and then realized I can't get out. <laughs> so I'm like all fired up at the door, just like, the box ready the door. to like go down and like and fuck up these junkies. <laughs> and then I'm just standing there for like 45 seconds, <laughs> waiting for a key, just like a bullet a gate kind of thing, just waiting there. to go. And then, anyway, we get we get down to the... We run down the corner, and this junkie chick is, like, bolting with, like, a gear bag. So we're like, oh, shit, they've broken into the van, and they've stole our gear bags with, like, our riding gear in it. So then Maddie's just, like, legged it, grabbed the handle while the chick's got the handle, and he just starts, like, swinging her around. <laughs> anyway, she's fucking screaming, like, ah, ah. Like neighbors have walked out and shit, and um, and Maddie's like, "Is this your bag, Jace? Is this your bag?" I'm like, "Nah, it's nah, not it's my not bag." bag. Eh? <laughs> so we we thought they'd robbed us. And they thought we were robbing them. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just this full no, It was just, uh, what do you call it, uh, confusion. Oh. It was just mass confusion. Oh, it was so funny. And Maddie's all fired up, like, because he, like, if you wake up to that shit, for you, sure, you know, you're, like, you're freaking heart out. Heart immediately goes to 180. You just want to go down there and sort it out. And then yeah, I was just standing there, like, kind of laughing because I could see that <laughs> the it whole wasn't situation. <laughs> it was fucking hilarious, eh? Hey? So, yeah, anyway, that fucking, that happened. Yeah gotta love it <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favorite burnout then of all time have you got one that just like was a full show stopper oh there's been a few the last au 
was they've both been good we've welded the diff up in them and they do <laughs> solid burnouts like solid burnouts dude back. apparently that like all the kids that get into drifting these days are using those au falcons because of like the diff that they've got the diff is indestructible you literally just take the hat off the back weld the crown up and she's good to go you have an <laughs> ultimate drift car and i had the wags and the wag the first one was the wags and it was even better because it's like a little longer yeah and you could just had so much control over on the nice green grass just oh, dot, dot, dot. it was so good and like like you say they are indestructible the engines are are a solid bush basher because <laughs> yeah. uh, i guess that is a good place to start with your whole backstory like you're pretty much just a bogan from townsville really that pretty is much. now yeah. fucking really good at riding motor <laughs> gp bikes yeah I, uh, that's what that's what i always say you can sort of take the townsville ah uh, the boy out of townsville you can't take the townsville out of the boy yeah so. you're pretty solid proof of that actually yeah so uh no i still enjoy going home and literally i got my first car at 17 on the farm and ah uh, seven on the farm and had one ever since you know there's always one rolling in and rolling out you, literally because you get them now the biggest thing with the old girl is she's not super stoked on having you know shitty cars laying around the house <laughs> just so. shit boxes everywhere. yeah so what you do is you just get like the scrappies come they'll pay you 50 bucks and take the car away really so it's, yeah unreal they're just taking away for scrap metal so it's perfect you perfect guys, situation you, you just, just keep them on the, keep them on the rotation <laughs> you guys just have a doll dude yeah um so we when we spoke in melbourne on the podcast i don't know how the fuck i was so dumb to just not know how like close we sort of all were in terms of all the people we hung out with the right like we were for sure at a lot of races you're at and dad's like dad goes to me after the melbourne he's like you're a fucking idiot you've watched jack race like a million times on 60s and 80s and i was like fuck probably like i don't know surely surely i, I would have been off just running a mark somewhere else you know you guys would grow a little bit older than us yeah then, so i was one of the just little groms running around shit all over his face and whatnot <laughs> covered in dirt dad goes you remember jack he was a kid that either beat jets or fucking cartwheeled yeah. and i was like i actually do remember that that was pretty much yeah that's my whole motocross career has been like that it's either go really well or go on the meat wagon home that was about it <laughs> the old meat wagon yeah i do not miss riding that fucking track though which one woodstock yeah oh me neither that place it's always been pretty savage it's always been square edges hard you know it, it's a it's a great uh, learning ground i guess you could say mm. a breeding ground because it is just so rough and gnarly especially like when we had queenslands and stuff like that there was always nuts yeah square edges like <laughs> that big <laughs> right in the middle of a corner and you're just like tut, tut, tut. and especially like when you're young you don't care about it but now you get older yeah you're just like what am i doing and, this for? and you wake up monday morning and the back's just hanging off because you've just been getting jackhammered the whole, <laughs> the whole day it's uh no nah, but there's a few good ones around we were lucky you know fortunate at that time uh to to have so many tracks around to go and ride for example up in Cairns or Mareeba or anywhere yeah. like that sort of that north you know north queensland area we had quite a lot of uh races going on did you ever ride tully i did a couple times that yeah. was probably my favorite track i used to love the what nuts. was the other one what was the other one up there uh with i don't think it's uh, mirror winnie yeah so no, i was, that was, I was there, about to say did you ever ride mirror winnie mirror that winnie. was probably did you do you remember that track I remember it never got to ride it. Though. Fuck, dude. That was like... I only got to solid. race that one time, and that was I like rode legend once. status. I rode it once, and I left there with my hip out to about oh, here. Oh, yeah, The shit. old tree roots got me. Yeah, because it was used, like Unadilla pretty much, eh? Yeah, tree, tree roots in every rut pretty much, but it was sort of like natural flowing, like yeah. the, the layer of the land. It was, it was sick. Cyclone Larry fucked up. That. Really? Why, yeah, that's why that stopped because when that cyclone come through just knocked everything over yeah and it was so far into the bush so this track that we had up in, in uh, Mirawini, which was just south of cairns uh it was full dense jungle like mm. proper rainforest i remember shit. it was so humid too oh there's no air in yeah, there it, eh? like, it honestly felt like you couldn't breathe and i think that's why the track was so good though because the, it was the under, ground like, was like sort of always, always wet yeah because it was humid under there it was under the canopy no sun ever got on it and it was just like because my dad grew up racing that track really yeah like it's been around that long. that long yeah so i'm i'm pretty glad me and maddie it was back when we were still sharing a 250f and we both nice. yeah he raced junior lights and then i had to get straight on it to race the senior lights senior lights <laughs> 
with a Ben bike and that. I was watching one the other day. You were talking about that. I don't know about Matty ruining the bike and then you'd have to get on it and ride it. Fuck, everyone used to do that. I don't know. It's because I just wasn't that good. Everyone would be like, if there was a good dude that bikes blew up, they'd be like, oh, yeah, ride Jace's bike. <laughs> because I'd, I'd never fucking crashed. Yeah, either. exactly. It was always it, straight. It was. <laughs> it knew it was a solid one to get on. Yeah. Pete had got it nice and straight. Never got revved hard. <laughs> Ridden always, on Sundays. It was always straight. One lady owner. Uh, but yeah you were the full uh you did like the full motocross thing and uh i'm interested to understand like how the transition went into the road stuff (laughs) and i think it's interesting though because you guys townsville had a culture of flat track and we didn't have flat track really in cans and we always like uh, i remember bagging out like i I was full motocross kid yeah who only went and did it on the weekends that there wasn't any motocross yeah because i like riding um and yeah like you say and then like i'd go and do the main main meetings because you know they were like aussie titles and stuff like that and mm. i was not bad at it so i'd go and go and race flat track but um yeah i i uh the main turning point for me to like i said i did dirt track sort of my whole career as well or junior career and then the main turning point for me was like when we went to 250s my first and only race in junior lights was Queensland's and in uh, in Townsville. Yeah, was that the year motocross. that Ford crashed? Ford crashed. I th- don't know. I Jamie, don't. I, I know. Jamie Bain had a big one. At Bain Queensland, had a big one. Um, was it that year? Nah, and I think Dale. I don't know if he'd gone senior just yet or not. Oh, okay. But uh, he might have been there. I think Redhead was even there still, or he yeah. might have just gone senior as well. But uh, there was a few of us and. First race was average, second race, like, a hole shot it, but they used to, like, it was a ski jump off the first corner, and yeah. it was, like, flat, basically, but then the next lap, they'd slow it down and put you through a chicane, and they'd come out after yeah, a ski jump. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And literally, I hole shot it, hit the ski jump, and didn't, you couldn't really see what was on the outside, a massive berm had formed on the other side of the ski jump, and literally, I just clipped it with the front tyre, got run over about <laughs> six times bike was brand new before the meeting and it was totaled like really dad pushed it back i remember walking back with him he pushed it back and like the exhaust was dragging on the ground like it (laughs) made it made jatz's look uh look pathetic the one that he did this year (laughs) yeah it was like dragging along the ground still got hanging on the wall at home in the shed like it was was, yeah the exhaust when everything was just totaled so you've got that bike on the wall well actually the bike's still there the bike got fixed it was like front end was all right but like from subframe back everything was just flat yeah all the way to the back wheel pretty much but and, and then so what that did that race it. what did that race mean for your career well nothing i was like i just sort of got sick of getting hurt yeah. on motocross and 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 whatnot so i was like and then somebody it was like right at the turning point um and somebody's like uh come and give a road bike a go uh, and like it was straight into an australian round the first round was in tasmania in 2009 they just changed the rules really to so the first time you rode a road bike was at the australian titles yeah uh, the ASPK series back in the day and uh it was uh they said basically well I rode like Super Motard and stuff like that before oh, that like okay. li- somebody's like uh, come, come give Super Motard a go so I went and rode somebody's bike I liked it and I went and did like uh the Aussies of Super Motard but I think there was like four guys and literally I pushed for a lap and then just do wheelies for the rest of the race it was <laughs> like my mum went off of me because dad was away working that t- weekend I went down there and she was going nuts I'm like mum the people want it and she's like what are you talking about I'm like at least fans on the wall they like the wheelies like, I was b- bored let's say were you winning yeah yeah I just go so out I just push for a lap and like literally <laughs> and then I was just on cruise control doing wheelies and mucking around it was great fun because you just like practice to do big back ends and whatnot but uh yeah i did that and I'd, i had a little bit of like uh road racing background or like road i'd had some experience on road because but, of the motard stuff yeah and then um yeah went and rode uh one two five because they changed the rules that year and said 14 year olds could ride uh one two five gp bike yeah sick so we went and gave that a go i rode everywhere new south wales didn't change their rules but basically i rode the the whole series except for the races in new south wales yeah and at the end of the year, I was like started winning rounds and uh, and like I won the the junior championship. And we were like, well, what do we do? We sort of stay here for one more year and you know be a massive fish in a little pond or go and be a tiny fish in a massive pond, go to Spain. So and like the amount of money and time we spent, you know, we were 
flying into into Brisbane and then uh, we would grab the van and then drive from Brisbane around and we still did 60,000k on the van and did like 1500k on the bike total uh, doing two championships and I've done like more, more kilometres than that testing three days in Hareth or somewhere like that so yeah. it just shows how much to- bike time the Aussie kids were getting compared to the uh, to mm. the Euro so it was like we need to go and do it because we're spending all this money anyway for no real let's say uh, yeah. nothing really back so we're yeah. like we might as well go give it a go so dad built a a trailer at home in the shed that fit inside a uh, a 20 foot container and literally pushed all their bikes all their shit into the container and wow. sent it to Spain no shit dude do you remember what it, your first thought was when you got on a on a proper road bike one of the 125cc bikes I was I've got photos of it still to this day. Like, I was full motocross style, and, like, anybody that comes from motocross, you always notice it. Like, I had Jacko and uh, Sheeny had done a little bit, but I had, like, Jacko and, and uh, Sheeny coming right. I got, like, these little 190s yeah. that in uh, in Europe. And I was, like, seeing that they were in Spain, I'm like, boys, what is he up to? Come. I got these, like, three of these little bikes. I said, come and have a ride. Like, yeah, there's always tracks open everywhere, and they're, like, you know, maximum 60k apart in Spain. Yeah. So I'm like, come have a ride. And, like, Sheeny was pretty good jacko was complete novice never ridden on asphalt really yeah <laughs> and he's right. like when you're a motocrosser you immediately go to sit on top of the bike mm. so you put way more lean angle on the bike so you crash all the time so i was like crashing all the time straight up literally head vertical upright so he was just trying to like ride it like a flat <laughs> you ride turn it like, you're exactly like a flat turn on a motocross bike where you sort of sit on top of it whereas with a road bike you sort of got to get underneath it and let your body do the turning more than the bike itself yeah right so were you good straight away obviously i was good good, i was good but i was was crashing what was the feeling like though unreal it's so fast like and like we had like very primitive to what i'm used to now but like you have like data logging especially on the 125s and like just having to be like get your throttle line so consistent because they were on edge a little bit let's say yeah but I remember, like, it was in Tasmania, and the back straight was, like, a flat, flat, like, tucked in six-gear corner. You're doing... It was the first time I ever done 200, and you were doing, like, 215 through this corner. Wow. And I was, like... And, like, this full tucked in. And I just remember... And the thing, biggest thing they tell you is don't roll off, because if you roll off, the bike leans out, it'll, and you start... No, yeah. you, you lean it out, and it'll nip up, like, it sees oh, on you. So you got to, like, really? try and keep a lot of fuel going into it. Wow. So you're, like, going through shit in your pants like trying to stay tucked in as possible like i remember being just so nervous with that sort of thing just the speed of things how quickly everything comes but you just get used to that sort of thing it's like anything what what was your like what was your headspace like to go from just racing motocross and flat track in townsville where you're not doing what what's the top speed in a flat track like Ma- maybe maximum maximum 90. Maybe, yeah maybe 110 if you're lucky on the long track yeah uh, maximum so what was do you remember the it was feeling nuts. Where I just you were remember just like, being like the, the first time I ever did 200 I'm like what I got 200 like because it was had a corner in it basically I was like what I was doing 200 that was through a corner like I couldn't believe because you know when you're a kid especially growing up in Australia where everything's so restricted with speed limits and stuff yeah. like that you're like 200 feels like you know almost un- unattainable like you're in Star Wars <laughs> exactly exactly it almost feels unattainable and now with the MotoGP bike you know we're getting like 350k in there and it just feels like any other day so it's 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 nuts when you think back on it like that but yeah it was that was the hardest thing was just the the way how quickly everything comes up on you and also like understanding where your bike is on track because you know you got to try and use as much of the track as you can say entering a corner or exiting a corner so you got to have that like understanding where both wheels are yeah and like you've got to be like almost pinpoint accurate let's say mm, because it, and then if you run even you want to go as wide you as d- possible yeah. but if you run a millimeter too wide it's over yeah and uh like they used to have astroturf on the outside of the tracks like, oh. i was always really wild like you speak to anyone on a motocross bike anything i'm i still am pretty pretty out of control <laughs> but i used to like running onto the astroturf all the time like go off the track but now they got this rule where it's like if you go onto the green now it's painted concrete because astro when it'll get wet which oh, i found yeah. out the hard way because i crashed twice in one session and like my second race in spain <laughs> <laughs> just nicked the it rained the night before and just nicked the astroturf because i used to run over it all the time like Fuck. track limits and i did not have a a, <laughs> a, a a good reputation but uh or good understanding but uh yeah, I used to run it real wide off the end of the track. And, like, I've been through so many gravel tracks. It's not even funny. Just riding because <laughs> you run wide. 
and you just try and keep it pinned and just hope it's going to come around eventually and it doesn't and you just off the end of the track oh shit 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 and those slicks don't have too much grip have you done much riding um like just road bike stuff but through you know like the crazy euro sort of roads that you know like the, those spanish not, roads not, and not shit. really like when i was a when I first, so was, this is one for you. When we first went over, <laughs> this is one for you. <laughs> Fuck, anytime Jack says that, the I get so excited. <laughs> I was like stoked because I'd read on the internet that you don't need a license, like, to ride a scooter. Like, it was like an understanding, and it was true till like three years earlier before I got there. I got there and met some friends that we ended up renting like a warehouse from. So we lived in a motorhome in the where inside the warehouse, like just drove the trailer in and everything, and just basically lived out of the warehouse and the people who were renting off lovely people mum and dad are still in touch with them now you know they come to some races but uh he had like an old scooter and it didn't run i'm like i'll get it running easy <laughs> so i like, got it running and i'm like M- uh, mum's like uh don't be riding around and i said mum i've read it but it's not registered yeah it'll be right because the number plate's completely different to what they were running when when i was there Anyway, one day I just used to zoom around the shops and shit, and just I was out riding it all day. It was like there was when you're <laughs> a kid in Europe. This is the biggest thing I tell like young kids coming over there. It's like you got to get used to doing nothing. There's like you don't know anybody, you, you don't, don't have anything. Language. You've got a motorbike that you can ride on the race weekends, but that's about it. So it's super hard. Like you got to get used to it. just hurry up and waiting. But this gave me something to do. So I was like zooming around on it every day, and then. Uh, probably a week goes by i go through the like it's like a big valley let's say out the other side and sure enough there's coppers like they do like these things in spain where they just park on every exit around about i'm like indicated everything just boost it through <laughs> acting real calm <laughs> back street back street back street and then i like, had to cross the front street to come back to the like go like another way back to the house <laughs> and i'm like oh shit all right on the front street as soon as i wheel down the front street cop car coming up the other way just oh in front of me they're like they're like getting angry at me i'm like english english i don't speak spanish <laughs> and they're like you follow me if not and i'm like <laughs> yes yes, sir. yes mr officer i'll follow you <laughs> go back down the house mom i need my passport what do you need your passport for uh the police got me what the f-? She just lost it just lost you, it dude and i'm like yep uh yeah so i go out there i'm dealing with these the coppers and they're like yeah you gotta come back to the station so I'm like, shit, like, in the back of the fucking cop car, <laughs> 15 <laughs> years old. They, like, chained the scooter to the fence, and and then they took me there. I got, like, it was the weirdest shit I've ever had. I got strip searched the whole lot. Wow. had me sitting in a little cell. It was so bad. And the worst thing is, and then I had to wait for a translator to come in to go through, like, this, like, it was almost like an auto court, I think you could call it. But I got out the same day, like, that night. I, this was, like, very early in the morning, and I got out that night. And I remember they come, and they're like, oh, it's like, 700 bucks like euro which is big money yeah that's decent cash and dad i just remember dad yelling them leave the little cunt in there he's gone <laughs> and <laughs> mum's like mum's like they're nearly crying and shit it was just <laughs> the weirdest shit so you had to pay that and then they come and unlock the scooter off the fence but they never did so and like there was a nightclub just down the road and like people used to walk past drunk all the time and they were fucking kicking the scooter and shit so one day i just went out with a hacksaw and cut it off the fence and <laughs> threw it inside the, the 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 workshop i just made a little speedway track inside the workshop like figure eights and that <laughs> but uh yeah that's about my road biking experience on the road that's about it dude you'd love to do like that vietnam tour and stuff for sure we've done, even like... the one like you did at the cape dude that's like oh. a bucket list thing for me yeah well, we're gonna do that again in 21 <laughs> i want to just get like this year be too like too quick to do yeah. it again because like fuck it was pretty hard but uh not not pretty hard but it's just like it's a big commitment. organization yeah like just to, it's to, a lot to of make it happen and everything. but like chad really wants to do it like reedy's keen as to do it townley wants to do it toby wants to do it i reckon we could get like i used that. to go up there quite a bit as a kid like we did go up, yeah once a year um we go up to rutland plains and like that yeah, yeah. and a few guys had uh like a connection with the guy up there and we go like up a station or something yeah and they go and work there for like a day or two days on the on at like the station like one was a sparky yeah right dad would be working on you know the vehicles or discs or tractors or whatever yeah and then one of the other ones was a plumber so he'd like fix all the plumbing in the in like the the master's yeah, quarters yeah. Or, or whatever 
and then we'd go and park down at the river basically like it was nearly like half a day drive to the back of the property and you park up and we camped there for like a week and it was honestly the best bar of fishing i've ever had in my life yeah like, right crocodiles fucking thousands and thousands of <laughs> crocodiles <laughs> massive things too. yeah but it was yeah that it was honestly going out of the cape is one of the greatest experiences you can say to anyone because you are oh, in yeah. the, the last little bit of like untouched of australia i feel you know apart from going out in the middle yeah dude i had moments on that trip where just fifth gear wide open sandy corrugated roads and it it just felt like the bike was floating like it didn't even feel like i was riding a normal bike anymore and i got maddie there and it's like dad's behind us there's fucking like just a straight endless road bushfire burned out like it was just such a sick, surreal experience. And, like, even um, coming the back way into Cooktown, there's, like, this beautiful asphalt range. Like, I want to do... Man, one day we should get, like, a, a proper road bike up there, close the roads, and do, like, a, a filming section on this bit of road, dude. It is fucked up. Like, some of the most beautiful shit I've ever seen. Just, like... It just, it just looked like... You know that kind of green that you get before it transitions fully into the outback and mm. it's like kind of spread out yeah, green yeah, treetops yeah and like it what a bushfire I've been through so it would have all been just nice and fresh and yep. been real green too oh so and we look just we fun. come in on like on sunset but you could see the you could actually see the ocean like where cooktown yeah like the actual unreal, like the, the landing there. there yeah oh so like yeah going up there would just be the fucking the best filming oh, i love it i love it to be honest that's like i can't wait that's the biggest thing that i miss about australia is just doing things like that like we used to go there when we were kids Mm. pretty much once a year we we go every year and uh like sometimes grandparents would come up or whatever like my dad's parents uh, and both my parents are from new zealand yeah they come over and dad would take them up to the cape and show them you know what australia was really about and I was used to so I'd always hook me lure up a tree or something like that and I remember I have memories of me hanging out over a tree full of croc infested waters and dad nudging the tinny in the tree the tree swinging like this and my granddad's going like are you serious right now? <laughs> yeah because New Zealanders are so like they just think Australia well everyone thinks Australia is like nuts. the craziest it is, place. It, it is, is nuts when you get up there like I mean the dog yesterday at home he ripped a taipan apart and I mean like that was just I was literally out there putting sprinklers in about an hour before and this taipan we were out there looking at the marvel i've done you know like how amazing my job was of putting in these sprinklers and then next minute a type engine straight through under us and it's like fuck me welcome to australia yeah <laughs> dude yeah it's fucking it's actually actually is no joke yeah but when you grow up here you, you just get don't, used yeah, to you just don't really that, that's what i tell like people like i remember being a kid and like it was like a fascination you know if you've seen a snake you try and get rid of it when it was around the house i remember being kids like chasing king browns and <laughs> getting king rams with shovels and stuff when you're like seven years old and you look back and think fuck if that thing got me that's I was good gone. Yeah, but you don't know no you know, exactly when you're a kid you don't know any better that um the way you talk about australia we were kind of talking about that last night like when you watch the the chad podcast mm. like what was it about that that resonated for you uh definitely like the thing about missing australia like when you got to go over there you got to sort of try and put everything behind you otherwise you, you do get distracted let's say because it is such we're so fortunate to have this country of ours and to live here like um i love it down south and everything like that but where especially where we are up there it's just no traffic there's just beautiful beaches beautiful islands you go you know an hour in the boat and you're in the best scuba diving you can go in the world you know you go anywhere you want where i live you can literally take the quad and you can go for fucking hours on end and not see another vehicle so i mean we grow up in like paradise let's say paradise especially for european guys like that is like the ultimate dream because they're all in like tiny little apartments yeah. jammed next to each other and when i tell them you know <laughs> you can go riding where i am and you won't see another bike all day they're like that that can't be true i'm like no <laughs> it's pretty much like that and do you struggle with like missing home because it's I do. been 14 men when you moved to spain it's kind of gnarly yeah uh, especially like i've learned how to how to deal with it there was a few years there and when it got like hard like let's say especially when you're young in a team uh the team sort of want you to be there the whole time mm. they want you to be a european they don't want you to go home for christmas they don't want you to do this they don't want you to do that i see some of the boys like uh, i was talking with uh richie the other day richie evans was yeah. up at home with jackson 
and I was like, dude, Mitch is still in Europe now. Like, what the hell is he doing there? He needs to get back here and just take five. Enjoy Christmas. Enjoy and Christmas and just enjoy the Australian, let's say, lifestyle and, and, and like, the way that we all – we're a friendly kind of people from what <laughs> I gather compared to, like, yeah. other countries around the world, whereas we're a very social people. We like to get – interact there's like i know at home there's always cars going in and out in and out you know yeah. always mixing and mingling and fucking around with our friends and when you're over there you don't get that kind of vibe let's say or like come around to mine for dinner yeah come, you know we'll have a barbie you know none of that so you just especially this time of year you need to come back and the weather's shit over there this time of year <laughs> it's just freezing cold it's depressing and especially when you're young in a team it's kind of hard to you don't have the power to say anything. Yeah, to say, nah, yeah, listen, yeah. I'm going home. But as you get older and, you know, you get more power and you understand what works for you, you say, listen, I'm going home from this date to this date. I'm done. I'll do my training and get organised and I'll be ready to come back next year. But for this moment, I need to go home. Yeah. That's the biggest thing. Yeah, I mean, dude, you know the one thing that I miss? that It sounds... Um probably sounds like trivial but i used to just fucking miss cunts rocking up out of the exactly. blue out just of the blue. out of the blue yeah. like every the thing in america was always like oh you gotta schedule at five we'll, o'clock we'll, we'll and, meet at yeah. so much so and so yes and it's like it's like i can't just rock up bring, exactly. bring some fucking and beers don't don't like i fucking hate telephones i am the worst person <laughs> yeah, on telephones. i lose them i'm just useless i hate replying i just I love it when people we don't have to schedule you just rock up and we'll have you know there'll be beer there or we'll have a beer or whatever or we'll just rock up and we'll fuck around for the day yeah that's why Franco's pretty good because he don't like a telephone either too much so <laughs> and he knows where I live so it's pretty easy he can just rock up but we you know it's always been like that I um I had my best mate who passed away in 2011 Hayden Pittman I don't know if you remember Hayden I do Pittman. remember Hayden that was a fucking sad day and uh like he lived probably i want to say like five six k away from me originally like through were you guys close in like. age you yeah were one right. year one year yeah. apart like yeah. we were best mates from like the day i met him and then like he ended up moving next door to me like my farm was like right next to his farm they moved in next door like we were mates for like a good six seven years before this happened then like he moved in next door and we'd just be fucking around every day yeah like his dad had a bobcat uh like a earth moving company yeah like three four bobcats and we'd just yeah. be down the back building jumps building shit i had a backhoe an excavator and trucks and whatnot and we'd just be fucking around all day you know 13 years old and he was a equipment. good rider too he was good he was just another one of those ones like naturally talented big boy but just naturally talented and like we'd just fuck around all day on the same jump just hitting the same jump <laughs> seeing who could do the best whips and like the only two people we were judging was you and him and of course you're going to say your whip was better than his whip and he's going to say his whip was better than your whip but we just fuck around all day and then like i remember one school holiday when he wasn't even there uh when he wasn't living next to me but he'd like bought his bike out as soon as a uh, school holiday started and he was on a kx 85 and i was on rm 85 and yeah i think it was two weeks we did a 205 liter so a 44 gallon drum we pre-mixed wow. a 44 gallon drum of fuel and we did that in two weeks on 285s dude that's unreal i think unreal. we did about one air filter <laughs> 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 but you gotta think about like Mom a tiny man. little carby yeah. how much fuel is going through that tiny little carby we go all day and then like because we were ruining our race bikes the oldies bought us like a drz 125 each oh he had a black one i had a yellow one and literally how since good that, were those unreal. things unreal we go all day we leave in the morning i'd even like and drz's are normally really good on petrol yeah and we'd leave in the morning and we'd have to put like a a coke bottle like 600 mil coke bottle of fucking fuel yeah we got everywhere we got chased by the cops because we go and pick up another mate from <laughs> black river which is like eight, well, you remember where the stadiums ago, were yeah, that's yeah. ages away but we could like <laughs> back road it pretty much the whole way cross the highway into a creek and then we just go along a creek but you had to like lift a fence up out the creek and like lay it down run over the barbed wire fence push the fence back into the thing and you just you go through the creek nobody owns the creek you just go through the creek and uh through black river it was actually so it was like massive fuck that's ages out of out of where out of you were like, yeah. <laughs> i'm on the a, other side of town dude are you on the other side you're of black like river? no like black river's here yeah let's say center of town's here i'm over here yeah okay yeah. so you just go all the way basically around here and yeah. into there like near there. the army base out that way even out for a little bit further really? not towards woodstock but like, like on, the, on the other side of ross yeah so on the yeah. good side of ross river but out towards the rodeo grounds i don't know yeah, if you've ever been out yeah. there like out that way so yeah. kind of thing 
fuck, that's a way. Oh, we just used to t- just do shit like that. We take a couple zip ties, maybe some duct tape, and that was it. We were good. <laughs> it, whatever it was throw at us, we had it sorted. That's hectic, dude. What was it like when he passed away? Did that? It was tough. Were it you, was tough. Well, me, him, me, him, and Franco were all best mates. Yeah. Like once Franco come on the scenes, we were like inseparable. And especially when I left to Europe, Franco sort of moved into my role, and they were fucking around all the time. And then, uh, yeah, I was flying back from Valencia. Uh, like, literally, I came home the week before. We were fucking around. Like, it was like that age, you know. We, he got his license. I didn't have my license yet. And we were off cruising around and shit. Like, And then, like, the last day, like, I borrowed a CD off him and shit. And I was like, yeah, I'll be back in, you know, a week and a bit. And then jumped on the plane, went and raced, flying home. I landed in Singapore. And it was like, fuck, I seen everyone, like, get well soon on facebook and all this stuff i'm like what the fuck's going on so i like called his dad and i'm like john what's going on like what's happening and he's like it's not good man and then i like had another two stopovers got home went up there pretty much and like john just broke down to us and it it was tough that was a tough tough thing to deal with especially you know being uh, what were we there 16 yeah i was gonna say he was only 16 right and so he because he, he was a year old and he was 94 i'm 95 and he'd got his p's and i didn't have mine yet so yeah right and where were you so did you were you still flying overseas i was flying not flying home coming home oh. for christmas like valencia last round did that and then was like on the stopover in singapore when uh when i started reading all the shit because everything was fine before i left yeah right and it was tough went home sat up in the hospital for like three days and then yeah, they couldn't I didn't do anything realize, about it. Yeah, I didn't know you guys were that tired. Oh, we were like inseparable. Dude, he was he such even a got like he even got like trophies back in the day. I remember he got like this is like, and his mum, mum, mum and dad worked for the club like the yeah, whole time, yeah. as well as my parents yeah. did. But somehow, some way, it got fucked up, and he got a trophy from the club one year at like the the end of year prize giving. It said Hayden Miller on the fucking trophy. <laughs> like, <they laughs> forgot that he was Hayden Pittman, dude. It's like we were super tight, and there was a he was a. A hard blow, that's for sure. Fuck, cheers to, cheers cheers to the man. great man. Yeah. I know, fuck. That, that but was it, it, it was such a good time having them around. Mm. Man, I, I remember just him being like the chubby kid that could just throw <laughs> the sickest whips. Out. Yeah, yeah. It was like him and then Brady was... You remember, did you ever go to Brady's house, Stanley's? Yeah, I did. So Brady, literally, the. do you remember his track? Uh, Not well, but... At I, the back and then there's a dirt road. Yeah. And then I'm on that dirt road. Yeah, so I was right. like behind Brady's house kind of thing. There you go. That's how you know. Yeah. Now, sort of where I am out that way. Yeah, okay. And then, um, yeah, like Brady was just up the road. So we'd go and ride there whenever Brady wanted to ride. But it wasn't too often. We had to push him always. <laughs> I know, eh? Bimo, where's Brady at? Man, he finally come out and ride. But uh, no, it was a good group of guys. Yeah. And like I said, like there was always people going and rocking up. And we'd always go riding together, you know, whether it be they come and ride at ours or we go and ride at someone else's. But it was like, I'll try and explain that to the Euros. They're like, Dude, I never used to have to put, even when I was a kid, I never put my bike on the trailer to go riding. I'd literally yeah. fuel it up at home, ride to wherever I was going, ride, and then ride home, fuel up, we'll get some lunch, fuel up and ride back again, and you'd ride all day. Yeah. Which was kind of kind of hard for them to deal with, because it's like they're so regimented, like you go to a track and you pay your $20 and you ride for the half a day or whatever, and yeah. then you pack up and go home. I think that's what's like... A unique because you look at how many good guys come out of the North Queensland scene. You got Todd being probably the oldest guy, and even around him, you had like Harley like, Pizzuti and Luke Weaver that could have been just as good. You had Chris Nash that was just as good. Then you had Jackson, you had Wade, you had Richie, you had Mitch, you had Wilson Todd. Um, then you come out of the Townsville crew. But I feel like there's something to be said about guys that didn't have to fuel up their uh, like load up their bikes and go ride all they had to do was fuel up their bikes and then just ride at their own places exactly or like dad i never had to rely on dad let's say to go riding like as soon as we moved to a farm it was like i don't know if my mom was like gullible as or if she was like she knew for me she knew what was going down but i never had homework ever even though my report card said if jack had tried you know he failed this if he tried more he would have got it but I just rock up at home every afternoon. I swear to God, every afternoon I rock up at home and go. Mum would be like on the way home, or if I'd cycled home, she'd be like, "Did you do your homework? Yeah, yeah, I did it. Oh, at, yeah. I did it at lunch. Yeah. It's all sorted." And I just literally go and put my mum wouldn't let me wear gloves or goggles because I'd lose them around the farm. <laughs> so I was like, I just put on my boot. Generally, it was just boots and a helmet. That was it. And I go ride all Arvo. 
like inside your knees here, like yeah. where your knee guards normally are, would be that chafed. <laughs> Fingers, you know, never used to get blisters, nothing. It was ever that hard, but it was just like the best feeling. You go until you literally couldn't see anymore, and then you're riding home in the night, and the bugs are hitting you in the eyes. Yeah, yeah, I remember that shit. Dude, the cane paddocks used to be the oh, worst, they would man. Be They'd the have worst. so much bugs around the cane paddocks, and you'd be like... Ooh, do, 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 do. Try and <laughs> it, it, like, you go faster, then they start stinging more and oh, more, yeah. you just do not want to get one in the eye. Dude, there's some bugs. There's one bug in particular that used to burn the fuck out you of your get, eyes, They get man. in there and almost feels like they go like that. It's they like start scratching. S- well, there's one that used to sting, dude. And it used really? To, it kind of, maybe it was just in the cane fields. But there's this one bug, man. So that, we're cane fields either side of us, like... Oh, did you just have Kane as well? No, no. Either side of us. Oh, like, like Mackay and then... Well, yeah, you got the Burdekin right there, yeah, air, which is yeah. full, like, full all the way field. up to Townsville, basically, and there's a mountain range that stops it. Yeah. And it's the same on the other side. It's like Ingham's full, full yeah. cane, but it sort of stops just before Townsville, and then we're like... Brownsville, bro. Brownsville, dude. We don't get rain. We don't get nothing. <laughs> you, get fuck, you, get <laughs> you learn to ride in bulldust. That's yeah, it. You, you learn to ride dust. it. That's what you like, when I When I say... Uh, did one air filter I mean like the, I used to dust bikes I'd be like dad my bike struggled in the start and he'd be like you fucking dusted it again like I'd have to I've had bikes that bad like it started dusting on a Friday and I've ridden it till Sunday and Sunday and Sunday I was push starting it because it would not kick start anymore two stroke 85 and you'd have to push start because it wouldn't start with kick anymore dude Pazuti's shit used to be like that it's so it's like it's bad but it's good like at the same time because you just fuck, we destroyed so much gear but i was fortunate enough you know mum and dad were able to support yeah me destroying shit and they were always there to look after me and like get me all the new, new shit or or whatever i whatever you know we needed to go racing and like it was such an awesome way to grow up i wouldn't change it for the world what was it like to though to have your parents <laughs> like did you know how much they were sacrificing at the time like especially when you moved to because when i moved to europe it's sort of all sunk, sunk in. in you get into that age dude like 14 15 and like dad's company was doing really really well um right up until like 09 when i started yeah. racing road bikes and then gfc yeah. everything like that it all sort of made everything a lot harder let's say right at the worst but at, time but when, at that when, point you've kind of gone all in yeah, almost eh? yeah well like, that, that was it dude. it was another mortgage on the house everything up you know the beautiful family property that they worked their whole lives to get another mortgage on that he had a beautiful big boat that he worked again his whole life to get and like he got it by the time it got built and everything got to Townsville, I think he got 100 hours on it, which is fuck all if you're talking a boat, because he had to drive it from Brisbane to Townsville yeah, and then which back is again. Like fucking 20 hours. I think we had like there. 130 hours on it in a year, which is zero. That's yeah. nothing. Because he was constantly traveling around with me, and like that was his dream, but he'd did he get, dreamt about did that, he and then he sold it for me to go racing. Sold that, sold the, well, remortgaged the house, sold so many toys to. All of his cool shit that he worked his whole life to get sort of sold it for me to go racing. So I was very, very fortunate. Do you remember when it sunk in? Like, do you ever oh, remember, I, like, thinking about it? I pro- I remember it to this day being in Jerez. And, uh, like, I was always, like, a chubby sort of kid. Like, not fat, but I always had just that muffin top, you know, a little bit. <laughs> Especially, bit like, for the but Hayden's mum, like, we used to always go to either Hayden's mum or if my mum wasn't home, we'd go over to my home and my house and deep fry a heap of shit up like i get the deep fryer out me and pity would be down in the deep freeze looking for shit to deep fry and then like we were burning off but i was always a little bit chubby let's say and i never really did too much training i'd cycle to school or whatever which was quite a way it was like 11k there 11k home that's a decent cycle not bad for like you know a 12 13 year old yeah. i was like yeah i'll go cycle to school but uh, mum loved it because then she wouldn't have to deal with me and my sister arguing in the car over who got he got, got the, the front, front seat, seat. <laughs> but uh no, yeah. I fucking shotgunned it in uh in Jerez I remember he's like get out of the fucking motor home and go and run a lap or I don't know if it was like go run or go cycle I can't remember exactly what it was but I'm like yeah yeah I'll do it and then he come back and like probably an hour later I'm still fucking laid up there on the couch whatever and then he's like fucking get out of this motor home you you'll go and do this like I fucking sold everything with this was like the second round and like going over there you always know you're gonna go shit but i struggled like we got the bikes out of customs the thursday night i hadn't ridden since october the year before this is february would this, so would this have been your second year over there or first, the first year, year first year yeah we literally we sent the bikes over 
and he's like uh, he goes to me uh, uh, sorry we got the bikes out of customs the night before the first race I hadn't ridden in like three four months and with that I had barely any experience but I, f- I qualified for the junior world championship which it is now the Spanish championship yeah qualified was going all right in the race ran in the gravel come back on track still finished the race not bad like not great not in the points nothing like that but was a massive achievement because a lot of australians went over there and they weren't even qualifying and i was on a stock bike when i say stock bike it was a piece of shit (laughs) i I talked to like guys like alex rins and uh alex marquez and stuff like that and they were like you were not that bike was so shit (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> they were just two standard Hondas from Australian Championship that we took over re- there but my dad was from back then? yeah <laughs> I had no teeth dude <laughs> they couldn't forget it we talk about it was it you who yeah, lost your teeth yeah, we were talking about this the yeah. other day and it was like so yeah when I first went over there we but well, back to the story anyway we were in uh, Jerez and like results aren't ideal let's say there was a couple other Aussies over there and they were doing a little better than me but they were also better equipment but my dad's thing was like you'll ride a piece of shit and you will learn how to ride it properly and then we'll get a decent bike but when, yeah. you, when i believe you're riding this thing to its full potential and when you're gonna fucking run and train yeah exactly <laughs> so he lost it <laughs> and uh that, that was like the one day it sort of sunk in like right shit's got seriously i gotta actually start doing something now <laughs> like actually like because up until then i'd always been quite talented let's yeah, say i never really had to work and, like, and kids you know that's what kids do i think i think if your parents are too sort of like knuckling down on you at too young of an age yeah it's never gonna work yeah you're gonna rebel against that no one wants to be told what to do you want to have to do it you want to do it because you're going to get better and then i sort of it wasn't so much he did it was just because he saw the other kids out there doing he's like fucking get out on the track and have a run around or do something so you used to run like actually jog laps of the tracks yeah we we still do it sometimes like now but not as much anymore i don't really run too much with my legs now yeah they're all a bit Bit walk-eyed and that well one since i was three years old one's been about an inch longer than the other what when i was three years old i used to wet the concrete on the house and with the (laughs) Uh, like we had a Queenslander you're a kind dog, of a kid dog, eh? yeah <laughs> I've fuck being around and I, and, I, and I hosed out the concrete and I used to do skids on me pushing one day I looped out hit the like, you know, the poles uh, hold the house up 53% spiral fracture of my femur three years old I got photos at home and plaster up to me nipples got out Christmas Eve <laughs> And then, like, two weeks later, like, we had hardwood floors through the whole... It was an old Queenslander. I had hardwood floors, and then I couldn't deal with mum taking me to the toilet, so I started sliding my shit around. <laughs> and, like, the first day, it was, like, couch to couch. Then I go to the bathroom. And then next day, she caught me going downstairs. And she's like, get the fuck back up here. Because <laughs> I was going downstairs, get back on my push by, but all the floors in the house were all fucked. I had to get the sanders in to go... <laughs> because just from the car sliding on them, just wore the back of the cast out. But, yeah, I've been... A, you're a nightmare bro nightmare from day dot <laughs> <laughs> you're still a nightmare nightmare now but now you're just an awesome nightmare <laughs> yeah now learn learn when to be a nightmare and when not to be a nightmare uh, try so, to anyway so you you started sorting your shit out a little bit more you yeah like, exactly when dad when it sort of got real like that i think that's when we sort of like oh, okay we better better do something here you know like he has put in a lot like i'm i you know you'd hear because i mean it was originally it was uh my i got an older brother he stayed here me mum uh, my dad and my younger sister went over and then my sister was like off it because we tried to do home doing homeschool yeah at, while we were in australia and it wasn't gonna work you had to fax shit and like do this that the other like you weren't able to email different them. time zones and shit different time zones trying to fax stuff when you don't have i mean this was 2010 so yeah. like internet was just like the let's say the wireless internet that you know you could travel around with and that wasn't what it was no, today no. and trying to send it out of you know countries like spain or france or wherever it was a bit of a nightmare so like and mum couldn't even get me to do my fucking home or get me to do yeah. my homeschool at home when we, we like we started two weeks before we left and she couldn't even get me to do it so she's like fuck this you know doing <laughs> that. and that was how i dropped out at two weeks into grade 10 if you can count <laughs> the two weeks of homeschool that i didn't do <laughs> but uh yeah so then we all went over and then my sister was off it she wanted to go back to school so grandparents came over they were coming anyway for a holiday and maggie sort of persuaded mum to let her go home back with uh with my grandparents and then she ended up living with my auntie and uncle and uh 
pretty much stayed there until like the end of, nearly at the end of the year and and dad had to go home because you know he put a manager in charge and shit just wasn't going mm. right so then he had to go home and pretty much take control of everything again and uh and sort a few things out and so he left and there was just mum me motorhome trailer on the back lucky mum had a truck license and away we went like it was just us do you do you remember feeling like crazy pressure to do well or did not you just pr- not, not really pressure no it? not re- i never really thought about that too much like the pressure of like what if i don't because they were never like they never pressured me about the money side of things it was more about like just you trying how bad do you want it like yeah. do you, you, you said you really want it like how bad do you want it show us it was never like they never put the pressure on me about how much they were spending or you yeah know, this that the other and or anything like that so that was never massive but uh there was a lot of pressure for sure like as my biggest worry let's say was like i didn't know if i was going to get to ride the next year you didn't know yeah like, what was happening i remember that right up until i signed my first contract with uh red bull kdm that was the first paid ride i got do you um well first non-paid ride let's say well i got paid but it was like the first time my parents didn't have to pay anything for me to go racing yeah do you think you knew even at a young age what it meant to like actually want it i never really knew what i wanted because i mean when i was a kid all i wanted to be was a crusty demon and then that was like didn't really look too interesting so then i wanted to go to supercross and then worked out i wasn't that great at that either so then it was like oh well we'll give road racing go hey i'm actually not too bad at this i'll I'll keep going at this then so i was like but i did if i want something i I will yeah if i see like i'm good at i got all right at this and i'll i'll keep working at it i'm like it's let's say i'm not turned away easily yeah because i feel like there's guys that like a guy like dunge that motherfucker he wanted it it. he wanted it he wants it and then you look at he came out of what like b grade yeah you know last pick of anybody yeah let's be real and then there were so many other better people around him but and he who, was who turned that, out to be like the, yeah. the greatest champion of them all because i feel like there's definitely a thing where it's like you can you can want the idea of something like you can want the idea of being on a moto gp bike and 100%, doing those races 100%. but it's like do you really actually want the thing and i see a lot of that with a lot of young kids as well coming through where they they really like the idea and like and you see some of them don't even want it for the riding like they want it for the fame more than Mm. anything it's not so much like getting to ride the best bikes in the world and all that so it's like kind of hard to look at that when when you see it and you're like dude what why are you here yeah sure you can go do something else but uh and then you see some kids like you say like your ryan dungies and guys like that that are just grinding in and out and i see kids that are have like not very much talent at all and i go riding with them there's a few guys that we go riding like super motard and that and they are the most dedicated dudes i've ever seen in my life but they, they, they just, don't, they just don't have it yeah. they just don't have it yeah yeah but they are put, putting in some fucking work it's like if we could combine like what that they what they do with. but what i think is like that dude's work also sidetracks him a bit because he's too, too much looking at numbers and whatnot mm. like He's there, like, Euros are nuts on lap times and stuff like that, and they go to the track and they just want to see lap time, lap time, lap time. I fucking never put a lap time on my bike until I went road racing. That was the first time I ever went, put, seen, like, it was like, oh, what lap did I do? Like, like when you go go-karts with your friends, that's probably the only <laughs> time I've ever looked at a lap time before we went road racing. It was like, well, what lap time are we doing the go-karts? Because with motocross, no one ever fucking took a lap time. Dirt track, no one ever took a lap time. It was just who won, who didn't. Yeah, who won and who didn't. That yeah. was it yeah fuck that's pretty true i think that there's like there's a mix too where because i've i've thought about this now right like i've gotten good at sport in my 30s like i've always been like, technically i can on a fucking motocross track i'd have like the sickest style you look at me in photos and you're like fuck how good's that guy slow as fuck yeah but, like i just thought about it way too much like i thought about what you were doing what i was doing to like like you said probably too much i was just thinking about this perf like Oh, what would it, what is like the perfect rider? And then you look at you hear a guy you like you say, I never even looked at a fucking lap time. And you've got I to know, have a I mix know, between. Like all that. I want to know is like if I felt good, that was all that mattered. I, head head's always sort of been. I feel like like yeah, you're thinking, but you're sub subliminally sub, sub, subconscious sub, subconsciously yeah. thinking. I guess you can say like it's in the back of your mind. You're thinking about where you're going, what line you're going to use into this corner. But in the front, let's say, and what's going on? You just 
focused in the now what's happening right now what you're doing like with what you're feeling it's yeah. more of a feeling than anything i feel have you started because like nowadays i because i'm in my 30s now like 31 and i feel like i've just gotten more just secure as like a person i sort of don't give a fuck as much about what people think so when i'm doing sport or when i'm riding or whatever i kind of don't care uh, whereas i think when i used when i was younger i used to care what people in thought i used to care like yeah that. i used to care like what dad thought or i used to care if i was fast than this but i used to nowadays it sort of doesn't matter and i've started doing better. way better but it's like i wonder if that's something that guys like you just have forever you just kind of don't give a fuck i've always let's say cared i, I never want to be the squid you know out there and like um, but i mean like as i said i've had one leg longer than the other pretty much my whole life every every footy team <laughs> i ever got on like I'd always get bagged out because I fucking run with this like, <laughs> wobble. So like, and, and like then I sort of shy away from running a little. Like let's say shit like that. You, but it didn't really bother me because I go and hit the most people in, like on the football field. I try and tackle as many people as I could in one game. You know that was my biggest thing. Like I wasn't big. I never was big, like tall or anything like that. But uh, yeah, I you know I try and make up for it another way, and like I you know always want to fit in. But for sure, like I never really thought about what anyone thinks I'm doing on a bike. I mean, my style is my style. I, I've given like with, when we come to the MotoGP side of things, my riding style is quite different. It's quite a little more old school. I turn my ass in a little bit more. It's almost it looks like a a Mick Doohan mm. at, at some points, which was a really strange style. But he works. it's what works for me, yeah. and like that's how I feel comfy and. I don't give a shit what people it's how I feel on the bike and that makes me feel comfortable so I ride it however I like you know it's like being a kid yeah and people like you're loose well it oh, well, works it sometimes it, <laughs> it works sometimes yeah <laughs> did, when did it start turning around for you in Europe or like when did you start feeling like real comfortable and you think like midway yeah, through the year midway th- through that first, first year. year yeah I started going alright and we got some tracks and I like understood what was going on and understood you know who I was racing we were never there to get podiums that year but the next year like already halfway through the year i started talking with the team and then they took me on the next year um for the german championship and the spanish championship which i did both the that year but i only did a couple of rounds in the german and the next year i started uh i started uh i did all the germans and i did a couple of spanish and like i won the german championship um but it was a bit of a nightmare like I had a German teammate the bike seized never seized a bike my whole life bike seized three times last weekend Ugh. it was like I was getting stitched up <laughs> heavy but then like my, my current assistant uh, Thomas you got he, an he, assistant? yeah he comes around with me it's not Franco at the minute Franco's like he's oh, like my second one I was gonna say we need Franco to be the number Fran- one <laughs> he's the Aussie assistant and I got Tommy the Dutch assistant so coming back to Tommy Tommy like when we were in in uh this is how weird shit works <laughs> like mum mum's like a real outgoing person i mean you yeah, met she's her. She's, she's like really outgoing yeah. she like was over there lonely as shit when we were in the first year and we met thomas at the first re- well i didn't really even meet thomas <laughs> uh, but my mum had met his mum because we were parked next to each other like they had their tent set up off their motorhome yeah, off their right. like truck and we had our set up off our truck in the middle of the paddock and uh they met and she's like, oh, I met this lovely Dutch lady. You're racing her son. Rah, rah. I'm like, oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> no thought of it. I'd go, dude, like, uh, we did that race. And then, like, because we, we were in the north of Europe, dad would, like, we'd just drive to tracks that were on the GP calendar, like, that we knew were GP oh, tracks. Oh, yeah. And there's, like, all those track days. And you pay 50 bucks. And, like, we had a complete bulk stock bike. And, like, I'd just do laps and laps and laps on it. On At the end of the race meetings, i go all the back of the garages this is no shit and i go through all the tires that were out the back of the garages and like oh yeah that's a c so it's like a medium compound that because the aprilia's you could use a harder tire oh. uh, so i go through and see the compounds yep i'll take that and i just on my push bike literally and i'd ride back with like fucking arms full of tires <laughs> throw them in the back of the uh, trailer and then we go to, like do these track days and I just, me and dad would be there fitting tires, like just use these second hand tires, but it'd keep us going. Yeah. And they were free. They were thrown out. But uh, yeah, and then we were coming back from Czech Republic, and Czech Republic, the roads are really shit. 
like concrete like America, but worse. You yeah. know, like how the Americans are yeah. like, dunk, 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 yeah. dunk, oh, the con- poor concrete. The but then times the Czech- I thought I had a flat tire in America, eh? The Checo ones are like more inconsistent. Like Townsville Square Edge, Woodstock Yeah, shit. like Woodstock Square <laughs> Edge, dude. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like we're going along and fucking next minute there's smoke bellowing out of the trailer. And we're like, what the fuck happened? The drawbar broke on the trailer. We just crossed the Dutch border. Oh. I'm like, fuck, what do, what do we do now? We don't have a fucking welder. We don't have shit to fix this. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> now we're in a pickle. <laughs> and then mum's like, oh, Thomas is, uh, well, her name's Rihanna, Thomas's mother. And he's like, oh, Thomas is, uh, Rihanna's just up the road. Well, you know, like 150K up the road. I'll give her a call. His dad's got a, like a, a machining company, pretty much like what my dad does at home. He's got one of them in Holland. And, uh, so we're like, oh yeah, right. So he came after work, like four o'clock or whatever it was, knocked off, grabbed his welder and a generator and fucking boosted it down to us in a van. Then they're like, yeah. So dad got on the trail up in the parking lot of a shell there, <laughs> welded the van up <laughs> and um, went back to there. They're like, yeah, come back to our house. We got, you know, we got our truck parked up. You can just back in there next to it. The next round was an ass and great. Yeah, no dramas. So we go back there next year i'm living there full time <laughs> like really? we just, yeah they just it became like our second family which was uh unreal and then did you kind of need that do you think like to make the yeah, europe thing work mum did especially mum yeah. did more than me but it was good i met thomas and his younger brother geordie and we just become like good mates and then thomas like was racing me at the time he just he for him he builds his own motor he builds his own bikes yeah. everything like that is nuts like he built when he when i was racing him he had his own bike complete own bike him and his dad built the engine the thing. cast the engine wow cylinders chassis the whole lot apart from brakes and wheels yeah. pretty much and suspension everything else was built hand built wow. by themselves was it any good it wasn't bad it all it used to <laughs> nip up quite a bit like, <laughs> but his dad had always run it on the edge dude always and it was quick it was quick in one two five, this was in the one two five well, that's pretty days. Dang, but then Thomas was always focused on that, and he wasn't, let's say, that great of a rider. And then he ended up being like he ended up working for a team, and then uh, in in the paddock, yeah, he did a couple of wild cards like like I did to start out with. You do like a wild card, yeah, call okay. it. I don't know what you call you call it a wild card as well, yeah, motocross yeah, or whatever, but. Yeah. Where you're like if you're in the top five of your national championship you can go and race the the grand prix yeah in your home yeah, round. yeah right and um so he did a couple of them but then he ended up working for a team and then i'm like dude and the team was shit they weren't paying him they were doing this that the other i said well listen i need assistant because like you can't do all the shit that we need to do like the mm. leather suits with the gps and the, the airbags and everything every time you ride you got to take them back to the the thing and then when you're doing especially in motor gp you need to have like your food food bought to the box you can't be going in and out of the box so i sit in the box pretty much the whole day yeah right he goes and gets helmet services serviced he goes and gets the leather service to you know make sure and like does like a stock take basically make sure when we go for a flyaways that we have yeah the right amount of boots gloves you know all that sort of little shit that i don't want to be had yeah. hassled with as well as like it just takes you just organized yeah it just organizes everything else around the the paddock and yeah that's thomas he's like that's what he does for me now and like I don't even remember how we got on to Thomas. How did we get on to Thomas? What I just I randomly, I was just like, hey, what are you having to say? You got yeah, an assistant? I don't even remember why, but yeah. Um, so, then- yeah, we're talking about, um, oh, yeah, that's it. So, yeah, the truck story. But, yeah, so we were talking about how, like, you first started sort of feeling comfortable and um, yeah, so you, we oh, ended you were up pitting next to those guys. Yeah, I was pitting, yeah we, so we started, uh, like, the next year I went back. So I, that's how I got on to Thomas. I was talking about the when the bike was nipping up, like yeah. halfway through the season his granddad used to run the same bike that i was riding back oh. in the day as like a team yeah and he gave me a cylinder that he had like on his shelf as like an ornament he had it all sandblasted up it looked nice and new and he's like this is better than the piece of shit that's on your bike so we end up putting it on wow oh, yeah. and then the team were like they when they started making the bike nip up they're like nah cylinders fucked and i remember we go me and thomas like we were 15 at the time in like in his motorhome with a piece of emery tape uh emery paper on the wall sanding the the ball back down to flat making it get flat because these guys were just trying to fuck with us so bad really sanding it down on the mirror in the in the bathroom and like it was just shit like that like and that's crazy so i won that and then we were off and like i got on the podium in the spanish championship um like the weekend before that 
and like we were spending too much money there with what we were getting. It was last year of one to fives. The team was not buying any parts. Well, we're, we're not fucking wasting our time doing Spanish Championship. I did a wild card. Then a team approached me for like to, for us to pay to go for riding the the yeah. team for the rest of the year, which yeah. was on a KDM one through five, which yeah. was like KDM stopped developing the bike in two thousand and eight, and they weren't even on the grid. It was two on the grid, and they were run by an Italian team. But huh, it was a we didn't know anybody. It was just like a our way in, let's yeah. say. And then the next year again was the same. I ended up signing with them. This was two thousand and twelve yeah. for the world championship by full time. The bike wasn't what we were promised. This, that, the other. Was, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll give you the world, and then mm. you get this much. You know, which is super common in it's super, all forms you, of racing. Yeah, all really. forms of ra- racing, and especially you start dealing with Italian teams and stuff like that. You sort of get that feeling, like especially the ones that are all they're looking for is money. Money. Yeah. The, the, they have the nice hospitality, but they don't give a shit. Yeah. Um, I got like fourth in Germany in the wet. I led like eighteen laps of the race in the wet. Um. I was on the front row in the second race, but I broke my collarbone there. I broke my collarbone like five times that year. <laughs> um, just out of control, really. Riding, what? I was trying to ride it. Like yeah, it was just like a just standard. Like, too hard. Literally, I can go to the shop right now and buy the same bike I rode. Really? Then, on, like, it was on for sale. But um, I got onto the this team who I knew from German, from the Germany days. Yeah. They contacted us and they're like, "Yeah, come and ride up for us. We're all, we got a Honda engine, but FTR chassis." Yeah, and FTR were pretty good at the time. Like KDM were the best when we went to Moto Three. KDM yeah. straight away came in with a four stroke and just dominating everybody. Yeah, right. And the next year, I I went to them and like I was fighting for the podiums every race. Just like never got on the podium, but it fucking made me hungry because but the bike was like I was on average like eleven, twelve K an hour down on everyone. Oh, that's a lot. The Honda was really slow, but it handled amazing and because it handled good I could do what I wanted with it and I could sort of tag in with those guys and every race I got closer and closer and closer to them. And that's how I got the the factory ride then with the with the KTM to Red Bull But KTM. it was like that was like last last chance. L C Q dude. That was like even towards the end of the year. It was like getting to the point like mum and dad were like, we can't keep paying. Like we told the team like Jack's gonna have to stop. He can't keep paying. Yeah. How much, I, do my, you remember how much it was? Like, did you have to pay per round or? Yeah, they work it out per round, but then it's like with the German teams, especially it's like crash damage on top, this, that, the other. Yeah. Which I wasn't even crashing them, but it was like just weird shit like that. And, and we sort of knew like what was happening as well, so we're like, fuck it, like. We were doing good results every race, and they're like, "We can't keep paying. Like, yeah. We're not going to keep paying." This so you were trying to like almost bluff them a little bluff, bit. Well, we had to like, and like if they said, "Right, get off the bike," well, we'll get off the bike, and I'll come back next year and ride factory KDM. But it was oh, like, so you that, already had that the sort deal. of. I, I had the deal pretty much penned. Uh, but it was, but it was honestly like, like I remember the no, that was when it got tough. You know, doing the, the negotiations for did that. Did you sort know? Of thing. Like, did you ever really know how tough your parents were doing it? Or did they keep it from you a little bit? They reckon? kept it from me a little bit, but I knew. You you can pick up. You can when, feel it. Yeah, eh? you can feel it when you go go through that sort of thing, and you know people are pinching pennies and what you know. Yeah. I never really look at watch mum. Uh, you know, since we were little kids when business was first starting out. Apart from then, I'd never really seen her look at like you Too know much the, like the little price stuff. tags yeah. of things in the supermarket and stuff like that. And then you start watching it happen, and you're like. Mm. Mm shit starting to not be great here and uh but you know and also like aunties and uncles and stuff like that helped out as well i was yeah. very lucky with the family group we had and i had a few little sponsors out of australia and people like that just to help try and keep us going let's say keep the wheels on the bus and then yeah the next year just sort of i remember having that massive sigh of relief like hope and well once i got the deal done just and and like i had deals there for like way more money but i liked aki who's now still my current manager in europe yeah he runs the 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 red bull kdm moto 3 and moto 2 team yeah and he'd never even offered me like a ride but I, I, like we always had a good relationship and like i had big money offers from mahindra and stuff like that and i was like no i don't i don't want that i want to ride that thing because like uh cortese was champion the year before Salon was fighting for the championship that year on that bike, same bike. I'm like, I want that thing. Yeah. So I went up to him. So were you just sick of losing at this point? 
Yeah, I just said, I don't give a shit about the money. Like, I'll ride for fucking free. I just want that bike. Yeah. I went there for like a quarter of the money I could have got anywhere else. But also the way I looked at it is I was like, put in decent bonuses and stuff like that. And I'm like, I'm going to win. And when I win, then I'll make the money back tenfold yeah. on yeah. what I'm fucking, like what this base salary is going to be over here. So, And that was when I was sort of doing things all by myself or my own managerial yeah. duties it was not easy I was signing fucking contracts left right and centre and then I was in lawsuits and shit like really? that oh yeah because then when I went to go to MotoGP I'd signed but dad mum and dad it was a lot of confusion being on the side of the world they're like signing and then they're like don't sign and then the guy's like oh you need to sign this so uh, I fucking signed it thinking, what was that like for? a pre-agreement for Moto2 Oh, which you didn't never did Moto Two. Huh? I never did it. Uh, yeah. So what was, so what like, was that deal for? Well, that didn't come to light until I was leading the championship the next year, uh, <laughs> and then he's like, "Hey, remember I got your son that fucking pre agreement?" Oh, so it was like an agree, like you had to sign a thing that if you were like doing, a pre agreement, like we're gonna do a contract. Me and yeah, you were gonna do a contract, like a letter of intent. Kind exactly. Of thing. That's it. That's what it is. A letter of intent. Exactly. Uh, and then you had to try and get out of that because you yeah. went straight to Moto GP. I was like, I'm not going fucking Moto Two. <laughs> you got Honda knocking on my door. I'm going motor gp yeah but like the way that happened as well the way that all sort of happened was like i had um i always had this thing in my mind like i've always done massive jumps in my career yeah. i went from nothing to one year in australia to europe then already in my second year in europe i was already finished the last five rounds of the world championship so in the space of fucking three years i was in world championship yeah. and i was like man try something new <laughs> <laughs> and like sense, I was like GP. looking at it I'm like Moto3 no one's ever done it they're all everyone's soft they're not gonna do it there's no way like you'll be one of the last dudes to do it if you can pull this off it's gonna be fucking mega because like and uh like Gary McCoy was the only other one who did it to go straight from Moto3 to he Moto went, GP he w- went w- was then 125s to 500s he went yeah, directly yeah and he's like the only one to do it and like be successful I was like dude what if you can do like Gary did and just fucking go uh, direct and I'm like well, well like the, the, the way I'm explaining it to you now is like how it was playing out in my head yeah I'm like yeah that'd be alright and um, I remember one of the guys from Torna came up to me one day and because I was talking like some teams and you know they were trying to point me in the right direction I said well I don't even want to go to Moto2 I want to go to MotoGP so sort of looked at me and he's like what and I'm like no I'm, I'm dead serious I want to go to MotoGP I said you don't have any Aussies there I want to get a MotoGP. Like, two races later, I had Honda knocking on the door. I had uh, Satellite Yamaha knocking on the door. I was like, fuck, it's all right. So, <laughs> and I did the deal. Because it makes Honda. waves, right? It does, yeah. They, like, put, they put the feelers out and tell people you're interested. And because you, it's kind of like Inception. Like, people wouldn't have been looking at you for a MotoGP ride. And then all of a sudden, you're putting it into it their head, cool. and then you're forcing them to think about it. Well, exactly. I was like, I had that belief in myself that I was like, I can do this. This can be done. What made you think that you could? Just self belief. <laughs> self belief, I think, more than anything. Like I was like, yeah, you, you. I felt like I was always like I said, wild. Like I was drifting and sliding the Moto Three, which had no power. So to me, the biggest bike looked like the best one. I was like, I want to get on that fucking thing so I can spin <laughs> tires and like. <laughs> have fun and like turn the bike like a dirt bike turn it with the rear tire a little bit and this sort of shit I was like that thing that i can ride that that's yeah. got my name all over it had you ever ridden a full-size motor no, gp I went, bike I, the only road bikes i'd ridden at that point in time was a 125 when it swapped to 250 and then i went straight to a thousand cc motor gp bike wow. that was it that was my three road bikes i'd first three road bikes i ever rode do you remember the first day you rode a motor gp no, bike? I, did. I went out of the pits and i was like what do i do that? and i was like <laughs> Ooh, that's quick <laughs> and then you go to change directions and like from being on like an 80 kilo motor 3 you go to change directions like, and you're like <laughs> <laughs> and it's not even moving you're like what but then you work out what you got to do with the throttle to get it change directions and it becomes like an, an absolute weapon they accelerate the front wheels never on the ground it's just unreal dude I remember the first time I ever rode a thousand cc bike I used to my first job out of not out of school I did a couple like labour jobs but my first proper job was working for Kawasaki and um and then uh they we used to have to like ride the bikes in like into the back after every day then i got on this fucking thousand <laughs> i swear 
Went down the street. Hell, and I was doing like a fucking 95k first gear wheelie. And I was just like, fuck this. I'm putting this in the shit. Remember, I, right did a, now. I did an event one day. Like, I'd never ridden on the street, nothing. I did an event for Danny's, my leather suit company yeah. in Portugal. And they had like a CBR 1000 there for me. And like, they closed the road. We had, well, we had a police escort. And we, like, it was on open street. And I'm like, nah, it's fucking 1000 CC oh, piece of shit. You know, street bike. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what and it went what and lit up on the road I was like oh this is not normal <laughs> I'm like I'm not riding one of these things on the road oh that's exactly what I thought like, I thought you know for me asphalt's asphalt it's the same every track pretty much you know one's a little more grippy than the next but this stuff was like oh, ice it just went what and I was like mm, that's not good <laughs> let's put this back yep. on the shelf I will not do that again <laughs> yeah I remember thinking like because I used to be like doing sales and I'd be selling them and I'd never fucking rode one. I'm like, yeah, ah, this, this got and heaps this. of power, mate. Right, right. And then it's after that, I was like, oh, how much riding have you done? Because I fucking rode bikes my whole life. And they're like, oh, I'm going to get my license and then I'm looking at this thing. And as soon as I heard anyone say that, I'm like, are you sure? Mate, do? I don't want this commission, bro. Because it's it, I get it's commission your and your funeral <laughs> for the same fucking thing and I don't want to have that shit. Because yeah, they are so fucking fast to just buy one off no, the No, no, it's day. nuts, dude. I got a one now in Europe um a Panigale V4 and like I got uh is that a Ducati Ducati Superbike the 1000cc from Ducati oh, yep, the newest yep. one and like I go and do like I rocked up this year at Moto2 were testing in uh Catalonia and I was like fuck it I'll go and ride so I got the same tyres <laughs> I literally take the Moto2 tyres and I take them put them and I rocked up my van my bike still got the horn and everything on it literally <laughs> they took the lights off it's like got a, a race fairing instead of having like the lights and yeah, shit it's yeah, just yeah. got a fiberglass black fairing that's yeah. it I've still got the horn everything and um, on the front straight in Catalonia standard brakes the whole lot I was getting 309 on the on the GPS I was getting like 316 on speedo wow and that's a standard bike standard brakes all up the thing's going into turn one the brakes just fucking melting pad you could almost see the pad <laughs> flying off it that was just glowing oh it's pretty gnarly that they can actually fucking make those things eh? and honestly the way the electronics and everything are now on the the latest like street bikes is fucking good the wheelie control's great like you can have it to a good degree where it's yeah. not too much wheelie but it's just enough and like the traction control slide control it's unreal yeah, no. They can make you. It can get you in a lot of trouble. Let's say that because <laughs> you're gonna be going very fast by the time you do come off. So, do you remember then that the first laps that you did on the thing, like, and yeah. it was? You, did you think straight away you'd made the right choice, or were you going like? Fuck. Oh, I felt good. Like I was on the first year I went to the MotoGP. Honda promised me and Nicky Hayden and like Eugene Laverty and these guys. They promised us this fucking absolute weapon is this open Honda, and it was honestly just shit. It was really <laughs> shit. They were on Magneti Morelli, which was coming in 2018 or 17. No, 16. It came. I was on it in 15. On the Morelli already in 16, uh, 15. And they didn't give a shit because Honda made their own electronics. They didn't give a shit. But because we were on the open bike, we had to run the Magneti Morelli software. Oh, yeah. And it didn't fucking work. It had cut so aggressive. As soon as tyre get worn, you'd nearly have to turn the shit off. <laughs> and it was just rubbish. But, like, I mean, in my first year, I've... A lot of people look at it as like, oh, he fucking struggled so much. But, dude, I I beat Nicky Hayden in the championship, who was a former world champion in yeah. MotoGP. I'd just come from fucking Moto3. Moto2. Moto3. Moto oh, Moto3, yeah. I'd just come from... He was already there. He'd just gone from factory Ducati yeah. to the Honda. And I'm like, I beat him in the championship. Eugene Laverty, Formula Race winner in Superbike and stuff like that. I beat him in the championship. It was on the same same equipment. And they're all going, oh, he had a shocking season. Rah, rah. I was like, are you really looking at the same fucking shit I'm looking at? Like, <laughs> I am trying my best. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I rocked up a bit overweight and stuff like that. The first race of the season was just, thought I was like, once I got off the Moto 3 where you don't have to, where you're constantly watching what you're eating. Yeah. I was like, ah, I'm on that 450 diet. Got that Moto GP contract. I'm, I'm set, boy. I got <laughs> horsepower days. I can just eat what I want. No, and I blew up like a balloon. So I was like, oh, that's not going to work. I can't imagine you fat. Yeah, it's not. A, it, my head just turns into a balloon. That's the biggest thing. The main thing that gets fat is mine. Like I get the, the <laughs> just get the big noggin. The chins and the gut. That's it. Legs stay like that. <laughs> it's one longer than the other. Oh, and one longer than the other and just skinny. You look <laughs> like Kathy Freeman. Um, did, what was like? What was your? Or how did people take you? Like because you're about 
as fucking awesome bogan as it gets like it's, <laughs> it's where you're from so am i fucking yeah. love it but it's like how did people in europe take that shit like did you think that you were kind of like misunderstood in a way like when you were in europe or is it hard to in like way, be yourself in a way but you sort of understand how to behave around them but i find like people sort of like are attracted to that mm, kind of like I they want to be around there's like fucking disaster or whatever you want to call it like this controlled disaster so they want to go and hang around with him because he's like it's a good time he's a good time that's what it was like for me in america all the boys would just be like want to hang out fucking going out with jace because yeah. we know that something some, some some wild shit is gonna happen yeah. there's gonna be drowning in a sea of exactly. pussy and we'll be fucking exactly. lighting it up till sunday <laughs> sound like you frank <laughs> but i mean it's true like it people true. people really do like they, they attract like you know you get there's the an odd energy, one yeah. or one over but, but yeah people enjoy like I, I like to think i'm a friendly dude i like people like to hang out with me and i like to hang out with people so i think i never really had a problem let's say in that with finding friends and racing and stuff like that and but do you think like the they were all the thinking they always kinda... thought i was a little bit fucked in the head i think <laughs> is the is the correct way of saying it because i mean they like this, kids, kind this kid's nuts <laughs> you know from running off the track to every nearly every exit of the corner and stuff like that they're like in like massive crashes and still get up and they're like this dude's not normally well, what is in his head nothing <laughs> but i'm like this is nothing you should see what i used to do at home when there's no one watching <laughs> i'm dying <laughs> <laughs> yeah but like do you think that I don't know. It was like media and teams. Like, do you ever felt like? Yeah, I, feel I, like had, it's I had around to, for you a bit now. Yeah, right? it is now. I had to because it let's, sucks let's, when you have to act a certain way. Like, you did you feel like you had I to did, act a I certain did. way to fit in? You couldn't yeah, be yourself. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. What was that like? Well, you know, people they love you when you're going good, but they hate you when you're going bad. Mm. You know, and like um, that first year. Well, when I rode already. I started like I had the wild, wild hair when I was younger because I can grow like a mad fro. <laughs> it's just curly shit, and I had this massive fucking mullet. <laughs> You're such a dick. And um, oh, like I dyed best. it red one year and like shit like that. <laughs> and then like when I was in Moto Three, I had like a fat mullet, and it was sick. And like everyone loved it. And then it was like as soon as I went Moto GP, and you know we weren't doing that great. It was like he's fucking out of control. Uh, Look at his hair, da 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 da. da. So, so it's like the same shit that they loved you for. Yeah, three exactly. They applaud you, and then the next week you, you they're like, ah, look at him, he's out of control. Yeah. Look at his hair, and they're like, Fuck. I was like, what? It's been like this, and I like had to work out like what you could do and what you couldn't. Yeah. Because the same way, and like other other areas that like they'd applaud you for it when you're winning or yeah. doing what you were doing. As soon as you start having a tough moment, that will just that will be your immediate downfall. Yeah. So you just have to sort of. And like, how does it make you feel when it's like that? When you're because well, you're, you're young, young like you're as a well. Kid. Yeah, you're just like, all right. I guess I can't show to everybody. You know, I was too open. Let's say at the start. Yeah. I was like, well, can't be like that anymore. Yeah, it sort of sucks though. But I feel like nowadays, it's sort of circling back around. It's coming where back. People like want to see your personality, but you're probably you've probably changed for the better to where it's like you're more because do you think you were doing the hair and stuff for like different reasons than what you do now or was not it really, always not like, really it was just always because fuck it like it's it funny make fun, people yeah. laugh yeah that was it like it was nothing it was, wasn't because i was like fuck i need a mullet you know yeah, i was like yeah. it was a joke i was making a joke out of myself yeah and then i was like fuck it shaved the hair off and i was like well that's that gone and i was like all right i'll go the straight edge fucking yeah but does, is know. it as fun it is it's the same like you still have the same amount of fun but you just don't have it yeah you don't show people that you're having fun you do it yourself and you want in your own time but you don't go and do the things that mm. with those certain people who are gonna fucking go back to somebody else and say oh listen he's doing this and that the other yeah. you know he, we, we, we went to the club the other night after the race you know he had a good result we went to the club and we were there till one in the morning yeah and they're like fucking you know they'll just use that to bring you down so you just don't go to after race parties or if you do Keep go with a good a bit, yeah. go, go with a good group and you know what you're doing and don't ever like you can't let your hair down and those kind of things if yeah. you want to let your hair down and watch i've learned yeah i come and enjoy place. my time at home with my friends on the farm yeah and nobody there is going to be taking photos or carrying on or anything like that when yeah. you're fucking around literally it's just stupid shit putting your ass out or something like that and yeah that'll be enough to 
to I get guess like ripped in. I guess it sort of is like a small price to pay for a pretty dope lifestyle. No, it is. Like 100%. getting the right amount of GP. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Like it's just the the let's say it's just a maturity kind mm. of thing, and you learn what what like everybody, everybody. I think yeah. every job has it, and you just learn how to deal with it and what you need to do to get the best out of your job that you that you're doing. Yeah, because I feel like you are a very mature dude for 20... Like, you're actually immature as fuck in so many ways. Yeah, in so <laughs> many ways. But, but I think, like, underneath it all, well, if you've I mean, been forced to grow up pretty definitely, quickly. Definitely, definitely. Like, 16, I, I ended up... 16, yeah, when, when Sonia left, so... Um, yeah, I was in Europe alone at 16. Yeah. Six, well, halfway through when I was 16, but so you 16 got to, years old. So what, what season were you in when your mum left? First year of Moto 3. Yeah, right. My dad was with his mates in a, in their buggy. His dad rolled it, pretty much just, uh, rolled it. Buggy landed on his face, crushed his face. Fuck, really? This thing open. He died for like three minutes. Wow, I didn't know that. And then, um, yeah, they end up getting him the thing. He was in coma for like three days. And this was on the Saturday night when I was in Mizano. Wow. And mum woke me up in the middle of the night. She's like, Dad's had an accident. And like, Marnie's on the phone she's like dad's had an accident basically we don't know if he's gonna make it through the night I've got I'm booked this flight such and such time I'm going home what are you doing I'm like well fuck I just qualified today I'm going like I got a race tomorrow like I've done this before and it's not a nice feeling I'd rather be here and then I can yeah. at least get updated live by life like you were feeling like the whole Hayden thing all the whole again. thing all over again yeah. and I was like nah I'm, I'm, I'm staying here I'll do do fuck, this that would've been heavy bro dude luckily he pulled through he's got a hard head on him and but he i mean like if you look at my dad now to what he was like he's got a complete different nose like he had a massive nose like mine now it's kind of flat like <laughs> they had to take bone out of his hip and reconstruct both his eye sockets like Fuck. his fucking eye was hanging out it was wow not nice so i rolled the roll uh the ranger like the buggy yeah and he like went to go out to hold it up and then the fucking whole thing just sort of he tripped over a rock oh. and it just came down and literally split him through here the biggest thing was it cracked the back of his head and release the pressure out the back wow it was fucking pretty heavy dude you've had some gnarly shit there's been some stories <laughs> there's a couple there so what you before you were saying like the biggest thing for kids going to europe just get prepared to be alone how hard is it be alone like, be have a lot of downtime especially coming from a place like australia and going to europe it's just you gotta get ready for the downtime well yeah because you just always had the boys around you're doing the farm thing like that's it it's the same way you go we to grew do, up you go to doing fuck all literally no motorbikes nothing you how'd you deal with that shit it was hard it was hard like that's why like like getting back to like when i got arrested on that scooter and she'd use try and fucking i was Find always something to do a hyperactive kid so i was always looking for shit i'd go to skate park smash my teeth out when my parents weren't there had to lay in them lay in the motor home with the nerves exposed for three days waiting for mum and dad to come back from <laughs> germany and like it's just shit like that you just get into more trouble <laughs> Well, like mentally though, because like iso- it is hard. isolation is not something that people deal with that well. Like, do you remember? You got to have a good mental strength. I feel. Yeah. Do you remember it getting better for you? Yeah. Like you actually developed that mental strength. Mm-hmm. Like, do you remember what that process was like? Yeah, definitely. And you know, you learn to sort of adapt to it or enjoy it. Let's say. And I feel that's what I did. I just you learn to become your own best friend. Let's mm. say, like, you can have, like, you know, we were sitting in before and I'm saying about how I'm chatting in my head. Like, yeah. that's literally what I do. Yeah. When you're sitting there, you got no one else to chat to. You fucking almost, it's almost like you're going insane. But, but it, it, you just understand how to deal with shit. And it's, uh, it's become normal. Let's say, I think, like you say, you do have to have, like, that, what, you got to have that goal in mind of what you're focused on mm. and why you're here and why you started the whole fucking thing in the first place. Yeah. And then from then on, everything becomes a lot easier do you end up like visualizing racing just constantly or like your goals and shit you do you do like i f- i find myself i do stuff you know just again like that word i can't pronounce what is it Sub- like subconsciously. subconscious yeah that i find myself subconsciously thinking about shit that i want to happen and like yeah. i do vision vision a lot of stuff yeah because i think that shit's like crazy powerful way eh? and when you do have for sure because i i mean i can no no 100 percent. like i'm a bit firm believer in like tony robbins and that sort of shit and yeah. using the power of positive thinking like i wasn't in the past but i have become like a massive fan of you know if you fucking picture it and you really believe in it that much like 
That's all I've actually done my whole life. Is like just will shit into existence. Exactly. You think about it hard enough and long enough and you work, you do not only just think about it, you yeah. do the right things to get it there, it'll happen. Yeah. It'll happen. If you can picture it, it can happen. Did like you? It's just all to do with the, uh, like Tony Robbins. I love listening to his shit and what he's got to say about like. Uh, do you? So you do listen to that sort yeah. of shit? some of it yeah. don't worry I'm not there listening to the business ones about yeah. you know da, 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 how to make myself a multi-millionaire I don't that doesn't interest me in whatsoever <laughs> that that's that, that, <laughs> if I do that enough it, hopefully it will we'll see <laughs> but uh, no just like about achieving goals and stuff like that I love listening to that sort of things and using like the the power of positive thinking yeah because i've been getting into like listening to books more when i'm like doing flights and shit and i've always been a big reader that's me i've n- but i've never been a reader yeah. never like, i can listen to like audio books and the only book i've ever actually read is mike tyson's autobiography yeah really dude unreal, you know how many people have told me that that's fucking awesome unreal if if, if you can read it it will be a fuck it's some wild doc- yeah, like a wild autobiography yeah you know another one that's fucking really good dude that you would froth on is anthony Anthony Kiedis from uh, this, the from red, the Red, red Hot, Hot Chili, Chili Peppers. Peppers, yeah, dude. His I've got is, it at home, actually. Do I do. My brother bought it for me, and I haven't read it. Dude, it is wild. Everyone said about that. Like from the first pages too. Like it's not a book that like takes a bit to get into it. And then I've just started reading Flea, the bassist. Yeah, I've yeah. just started reading his. And man, he had a fucking crazy wild childhood as well. But he's even like Anthony, from Australia. I've, I've watched uh, watched things. Yeah, Flea's from Australia, but I've watched things on him as well. Like mm. about dad was a junkie. And I think the first time he did heroin was when he was like eleven years old. He crazy thought it was shit, cocaine. Though. It was on the table. Like I just like I like I watch a lot of documentaries a lot because again, being in you Europe, just got time. You got so much time. I don't have English TV, so what I do are YouTube documentaries or uh, Netflix yeah. document- documentaries or Amazon Prime or whatever Watch else I can tales. get on. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So I just try and... There's only so much fucking Breaking Bad and, yeah, you know, Suits and all these things that you can watch. You oh, sort you of got want to switch suits? it up. Yeah. Did you watch all of that? Not all of it. I'm, see, it kind I of find got it hard. shit after a while. Exactly. Like. It started getting shit towards the end, yeah. so I find but it hard that to That chick finish. was hotter than yeah. old Megan Markle. Megan. Fucking Jesus! <laughs> God damn! Megan. Oh, did you watch that shit, Franco? Franco, don't, he's been telling me all the drive up here. He doesn't even have time to scratch his back at the minute. Oh, fuck. He said he's Poor just Franco. burnt out. Poor Franco. He, he's moaning to me today. He's like, oh, I'll get home on Friday because last Friday or before Supercross Friday, he got in in the morning and I'd already texted him like two days before. I got in on Thursday from Europe. You were in South Australia and you're still moaning. And he's still and he's in like, South Australia. <laughs> and, he's like, and he's like, yeah, fuck I'll come with you man no drama so I picked him up in the morning went to air got my flat track bike took it home and then he's like man I don't think I can come uh, I'm like fucking don't be a pussy I managed to get like a couple beers into him so he'd like easier to persuade uh, come on let's go yeah fine bang we got him there and then we got back on Sunday at like 7 and he flew out Monday 6 in the morning back to South Australia so he's <laughs> up there and up there <laughs> all weekend and again last weekend he come straight home for two days got the bike ready and then we drove to Brisbane and then on Sunday after Brisbane he had to fly back down to South Australia go back to work fuck he's like man I haven't even had time to scratch myself and I hey I didn't even have to persuade you to come here nah he wasn't oh, missing I was, sit- I was sitting there doing nothing so <laughs> <laughs> oh, nah he wasn't missing this no one's missing tonight exactly um, fuck what was I going to say I got sidetracked on Franco I feel like everyone needs a Franco they eh? do everyone needs a Franco so <laughs> we gotta make a shirt yeah what, what was the what what was in the Frank sh- we trust in Frank we trust now wasn't there something else we were gonna put on a shirt the other day Did you, you had the best one liner ever eh fuck I of can't what? remember but he was rough we need to um oh yeah that's right he didn't get out of bed till what 11.30 or some shit spent three eh? months building the bike and can't even make it a race till 11 o'clock in the morning <laughs> I knew it was gonna <laughs> perfect time he just got there after practice he didn't need to be there for practice why wasn't the dropper on it to start with nah why was it yeah why why uh, because they put the jump in and we were like oh how oh. big's the jump gonna be right because right. it was on a corner before so we're like Fuck, I don't really want to hang an exhaust so. yeah true like go over the bars because of the exhaust so. yeah that was a fun event man what was that called you're doing it again next I'll year do you're it. doing it I'll do it fucking hell do it on it's the screen easy, eagle bro you got it man that'd be sick what was the event called North Brisbane remember. Cup North Brisbane Cup at McDowan mm. Raceway yeah what is it important to you just come home and do that kind I of fun shit? I enjoy that kind of yeah. stuff. Like you get, 
there's no like our grids and everything are nice but there's no it doesn't matter if it's a lucky say, a club day at North Brisbane Motorsport Club you don't get that feeling like you get when you sat on the start grids and every bike they you know oh but oh but yeah you don't get that feeling anywhere else except for with the dirt bike yeah okay so it's like something you need to get yeah have you just never let go of the dirt bike thing because you're mm. so up to date on the whole motocross and supercross and you know a lot of these dudes and you're like you're in the thick of it i mean fuck you built us the melbourne supercross track and you were actively trying to race do, do people know that you were going to try and race lights mm, not really <laughs> was it supposed to be out there yeah I, 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 now we can say whatever we want but yeah a little more time and i would have gone out there like going down there i could have had a go let's say I, I wouldn't have looked that flash like i had all the rhythms in everything like that it was just uh because you got the, the Dirtworks boys to come and do yeah, the... Pro tracks, pro oh, tracks, pro tracks, yeah, ProTracks. ProTracks, Josh come and, Josh and Quinny come up and built my joint. And yeah. Quinny ripped out the uh, electricity. <laughs> the old man was not happy. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, we... Good luck fi- doing anything about that, but with Quinny, he's a fucking oh, massive legend. unit. He's eh? a legend. <laughs> and no, nah, but we built that and like I got everything down. Honestly, most of it easier than I expected. Like I've rolled supercross tracks in America and stuff like that before, but... I wanted to do it on my own terms in my own place like yeah, not, in front of not have wires and shit on you exactly and then like got everything down really quick quicker than I expected let's say but except the whoops yeah your bike I mean, was too soft but eh? way too soft yeah fucking Franco did you do that mm. uh, the day before he doesn't give me much time <laughs> yeah fair enough then <laughs> <laughs> he's ordered springs and shit now so we're getting it sorted but it's too hot at the minute but oh, uh, it's bad up there Primac right? got me I, I teed up before the last race i'm like oh can you get me because they do all the lighting towers now for uh oh. for um canards and coats in australia right. and i looked on the internet and i was like to my boss at Primo, i'm like hey i see you guys are doing lighting towers you know what's the chances of of getting a couple he's like oh, i'll give you two and i'm like well i kind of need four i'll pay for them <laughs> yeah and he's like yeah okay i'll give you two and you know we'll give you like cost price on two more I'm like perfect, and then I went and got party in the last race. This was literally just before, it. and then I contacted him on like the Thursday after race because we had testing and everything. And he's like, "Hey, so you don't really need to move them that much, do you?" And he's like, "Well, I got these ones that that, that like you can." I said, "No dramas. I will pick them up with a forklift and move them." I'm like, yeah. Yeah. like, I got a forklift at home, and he's like, "Okay, I'll send you four of these, no problem for free." Like. So I'm waiting on them to arrive because once they're there, then I'm fucking golden, dude. That's sick. So you're gonna have a supercross track under lights at your house. Mm-hmm. That's mint. I can't wait. Yeah. Have you got whoops there though? Yeah, they're big. Oh, so they're like they're, That's the thing. Like I started going through them before. It was in between Thailand and Japan. And like it wasn't great. Let's say that. Like <laughs> I was missing probably about 10K an hour, I want to say. Yeah. And I was like, man. That's a lot to make I'm up. I'm not going to do this right now before I got to go and like do the thing I actually get paid to do yeah. next weekend like and you know that I'm supposed to be doing I'll show you yeah I got a, I got a video it. like it wasn't bad but it wasn't fucking it wasn't good wasn't great either <laughs> it wasn't pretty we'll find it here yeah because I can imagine that the old um, MotoGP Pramac boss isn't like frothing on you he was not Super stoked yeah when I put the photos up of like the track being built they were not stoked they were like what's this for Rara that's fucking awesome what do we got here where's whoops whoops for first day and then i like just put myself a cheetah line around them yeah i was gonna say you kind of got to <laughs> townley was did you hear all that shit with townley like trying to make me hit his whoops at his place was he yeah and i like all i said was he's so soft he just <laughs> he, like, who bin the old bun i just said to him i was like he just put up a thing like trying to talk shit on ricky i rode with him once ben did in, you know uh, when he um when he uh signed for factory suzuki in europe remember oh, when he made the comeback oh yeah 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 this year i was just riding in spain and like him everts and all the boys were there and like it was flat and like i, I was going pretty good that day like you can ask Ben, <laughs> i was going pretty good but the next day i went to red sand and completely fucking smashed my bottom of my leg into a million pieces wow really yeah like tib fib the whole like knuckle of the Fuck. Like, what so what's he gives there's the this. people for the jr80 <laughs> <laughs> wait answer it right now <laughs> just do it i'm not answering it <laughs> <laughs> Frank, uh, see, contact him, bros. <laughs> that, that'd be funny. Tell him it's for Jack Miller and see if they do your deal. 
they won't, man. She's like wanted to go over the specs and shit for me. I'm oh. like, dude, I just want to do a burnout. I don't care about the bike. As long as it lasts, like it's a JR80. They it's will gonna run last backwards. eighty seconds. They last forever. You'll never kill it. Like it could be here next year when we come back to do burnouts. <laughs> they are that good, dude. Speaking of Ben, that's what we need. That's the trip we need to do. Is we need to go to his house again, dude. My dad froths over it because like really? being from New Zealand and like oh. he grew up riding in those hills, dude. We should he's like, we should take the boys. One he's day. like, man, have you seen Ben? Look at the track Ben's at today. He's like Ben's number one fan really because he's like in new zealand just riding these beautiful big bulldozed oh. into hills just nice motocross tracks so, so i changed the phone and like it's taking that ages to yeah, I guess so. taking ages oh, to oh yeah you're on that on the cloud boy i'll just try and get you on the wi-fi real quick oh i don't even know if i know the password actually ah uh, we can we can do that on another episode yeah fuck it but you went through the whoops and you were i got through them like not bad but also the suspension was bottoming out every time i hit each warp it was going dunk, dunk, dunk to the bottom and like trying to fucking kick me out of the bar. So it wasn't too much fun. But <laughs> yeah, I love motor. <laughs> um, so when you uh, when you signed and you were you did that first year of MotoGP. So when did the ball start rolling of the of like that? I guess MotoGP success because like well the second year like in my second year in MotoGP and I won the wet race in Assen. Yeah, right. And that was like completely out of the blue. I think some some bloke I remember some bloke messaged me. How much did Tommy win? Uh, it was. It was. A, it was. Do we know what he? It was five. There was five numbers in it. So what's that? A hundred grand? Or yeah, I think it was. Really? Uh, so what's that? Like for? just like a mate. What did he have? Like, what did he have? Like fifty bucks on it? He put a hundred dollars on you every round. Yeah. What? He put a hundred bucks on me every round. And I think I was like fucking. Yeah, those three. Like a hundred, hundred and one to yeah. one or something. It was yeah, fucking. How much one. did he win? Like a hundred grand. Yeah. Fuck off. Yeah. Yeah, it was, but there was more. Like, I used to get messages for ages on Instagram and shit of people, like, who put five bucks on me and won, like, fucking 50 grand. And it was like, <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Jesus. I'm like, where's my, my cut? <laughs> what, that, they probably made more than you did. Yeah, they did. What was your bonus for winning that race? Oh, I was all right, actually. It was all right. Because <laughs> it was out of blue, like, and, like, they weren't expecting me. My so bonuses, you had, like, big bonuses. bonuses. Were big, yeah. Uh, it was a good, like, it was a good... What was it five figure day? It was a good five figure day. It was a bit over that. How good did it feel when you unreal. actually started unreal. making good money? Un- unreal, like, but like the first, you know, a lot of it's just going back to the oldies. Yeah, paying back, you know, getting shit. So yeah, what's that? And what's that time. like then for you? Like, so you 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 watch your parents struggle. No dramas. You like see for all me that. to give them, I'll give them whatever they need. Like. They gave me whatever they yeah. need, whatever I needed. So now, when whenever they need something, I'll be more than happy. You know, I'll do whatever I can for them because I mean, I watched them. They never questioned. They never said, you know, well, oh, I don't think we can do that. Mm. They were never like that. They were like, if you want to do this and you're serious about this, we'll do it. Like, yeah. Because some people is like massive for like parents to do that and put that much trust in such a young kid mm. or have that belief. But my dad. I think he'd seen it in my eyes from from years years yeah. of you know watching me at racing and seeing what I wanted to do and the thing is man like even you know I sort of had a bit of a moment this year when like me and Maddie were doing the Transmoto uh, the six hour and we're just doing laps and dad's running around and like it's a fucking enduro and he's like scraping the mud off every part of our bike and you well, know i saw like, pete the other day he, he was doing loves the same it. thing he's doing yeah. the same for my bike just at a fucking north brisbane like he didn't come there to spanner franco arrived late and pete was first one to step up to the plate yeah that's like, so he I, loves it like i mean i just think that's what dads that's do what and, dads do and especially it, moto dads they just love it and it would have been the thing where it's and like, i mean like can you imagine like especially like you guys from cairns us from townsville the hours that they like when we were kids dude we just park up in the back of the car and go yeah. to sleep and, like they were the ones that had to grind all day or all night get home and then he'd go to work, work monday morning yeah back to work and like oh i gotta fucking sit in the classroom and yet i was sleeping all night and then i got sleep all, all day and it's in the classroom it's like fuck dude they we were not easy they well were that's gnarly. what i did the drive for melbourne supercross right and I just don't think that people in like my normal life that aren't in like moto, especially like I got the jujitsu friends that I got and then the people that I meet through the podcast and then they're like, fuck, I can't believe you drove to Melbourne for just that, just for that race. And I'm like, bro, it was 19 hours or something. I was like, man, my dad would finish work at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon. Pick you up from school. Load up all the shit 
and he he would drive by himself through the night we'd rock up at like harvey bay or coolum he would have his fucking eyes hanging out of his head that's what dad goes to me the other day when we're at brisbane he's like most of the time i was walking around here i had fucking blurry eyes yeah i remember pulling up like they'd pull up in the in front of the gates like mike hatches here in the goldie he'd pick me up from school drive down here and we'd park in the fucking gates at like whatever time in the morning like four in the morning or fucking five in the morning he'd have not even an hour and a half two hours sleep gates had open we're first in line so we got to go through so he's got to get up then yeah and drive the bikes in the pits and fucking scrutiny and mechanic for me all day yeah if he was lucky you'd get a full night's sleep that night in a hotel or in the van wherever we were and then Sunday, same again, pack her all up and sh- win, lose, or draw, doesn't matter. He's still yeah. like swiping the credit card, driving the car, you know, oh, that sucks. We failed this weekend, but hey, here's, yeah, an- some- here's another fucking $500 worth of fuel to get you home. Yeah, and then sometimes you'd end up in hospital. Like, I remember Maddie one year at the, must have been the Queensland titles. He, You know, the, the whoops in the back at Woodstock, Maddie mm-hmm. went like triple, triple, and like the first triple man seat bounced it and went off the line a bit, hit a hole and just went fucking doodle doodle over the bars and the thing just slammed him ruptured his kidney he had to spend fucking 10 days in townsville hospital it's just like it's all that shit eh? i've seen shit dude yeah seen shit and it's like it just you know the the whole driving to melbourne to the supercross to do the podcast it just doesn't seem like that big a deal after everything they 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 used to do yeah. yeah like you see what they used to do and you're like hey fucking man up would you and just do it it's a it's kind of when you grow up a mo- like a motocross kid though it's kind of crazy all of the shit that you can sort of do that like normal people can't do whether it's like like you said driving a car at seven and all this kind of like crazy well, shit i grew up, up like doing. dad being he had the drilling company and like i remember the first like my pop taught me how to drive when i was like he bought me my first car at seven but i'd already started driving at like six on their farm and then, like, I was, like, eight years old. We were out near, uh, out near uh, Cloncurry, a little bit further out. Yeah, it yeah. Was, it might have even been in the Tenema. I can't remember exactly. That's how long ago it was. And literally, Dad and I drove up in the GXL Cruiser. He got out, hopped in the drill rig, and he said, right, just follow me, not too close. I drove for 180 kilometers by myself, eight years old, following Dad <laughs> on a fucking phone book in a GXL cruiser. So good, eh? Greatest day of my life. Yeah. I was there playing with the radio. I thought it was fucking awesome. Just <laughs> following Dad just across the desert. Unreal. Dude, we had, a, we had a day when we were kids. I would have been maybe eight or nine, I reckon, and we had an old 60 series Land Cruiser. It was a fucking four-speed diesel thing. That would have been unreal for a farm car. Oh, bro. It was the it was a, it was like the sickest rally car ever. We used to, another story, we used to, Dad would be the president of the footy club when we played footy, mm-hmm. and so they'd do the working bees like super fucking early on Saturday mornings before all the games started. Just to prep it, yeah. And then we would take the Land Cruiser. They had like a paddock that this old footy field used to be on near the mangroves nice grass. long ass fucking grass and it was always wet because of the mangroves and we we went out and made a track in there and like this thing used to be for, go from fourth to second and compression then just go, locker just compression <laughs> yeah. locker and you used to just fucking slide this thing best around. one i had was i had a vp i don't know how i got it or why fucking somebody ever did it i had a vp commodore my pop bought for me and it had a nissan <laughs> patrol motor in it diesel <laughs> I had a diesel Commodore. <laughs> I'm not. I don't have any ideas. It was gutless and heavy as shit. It didn't even do good skids. Like it would have been way better if it was just a commie. But I don't know how it ended up like it. But I ended up. It was a great farm car because you never had to put petty in it compared yeah, to like if you had a Commodore. Shit. It was just fucking put a bit of diesel in away you go. Well, this this one day, dude, I would have been like eight or nine. We went we went fishing up. Um, our uncle used to run the Burktown pub. Oh yeah so we'd go up there every school holidays man we'd stay at the pub fucking just watch fights every night <laughs> it was the fucking best shit ever and no uh, we'd just go fishing and shooting and rally driving and have the bikes up there but there was one year where it fucking pissed down and we had a boat trailer on the back we had this old cruiser and dad got to like the first river crossing and it was just fucking like Flooded. up to the guts just tire tracks and mud we barely got through the first crossing it took eight and a half hours to go 140 k's and dad got got up on the back side of that first crossing and he's like jace you're gonna have to drive because 
they got fucking shovels and were like digging the boat trailer out. Yeah. So I drove for eight hours, 140 k's, and I <laughs> while they were shoveling. While they were shoveling, mud you had out you had a good job then. Oh, you got the dude. good job. But it was, man, I remember Maddie. It was like it had a bench scene in the thing. Yeah. And Maddie was in the middle, and then my buddy Scotty Idek was that, in the and that fucking gearbox tunnel gets so hot. Oh, it gets so hot in there. You touch it and like that is like it might did it have vinyl or did yeah. it have nothing? Yeah, brown vinyl. If you get the fuck, even the vinyl, you put your leg on, especially yeah, on a hot day. Yeah. Like, oh, <laughs> That's the worst to do road trip in. They were so bad. I remember no, air, the old man used to go, "You want air gone?" And then he kicked the fucking little the thing, flap the flap on the, on the floor. Yeah, and yeah. Poof, it was not too bad then. <laughs> I remember every time you used to have to sit in the middle of the thing and fucking burn your burn feet. Yeah. You'd put your feet up on the dash. Mm. But yeah, that was the greatest day of my life, man. I'll never, I'll never forget that day driving eight hours in the car by myself. We had the fuck. It had a tape deck. No CD player, none of that shit. Crank her up. And we had we played. Mum would never let us play Rodney Rude. So, <laughs> had like, the cassettes there. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so I said to Maddie, there was a there was a green uh, styrofoam cassette like tape thing, and Dad had all his all fucking of it tapes in there. All of them lined Dad up. Dad had the same. Oh, bro, and it used to be fucking under the seat, and then I'd go pull it as out. soon as Dad and John were in the back. I'd go, Maddie fucking put Rodney Root on and like and yeah, there was that one where that song Living Next Door to Alice yeah. like we used to just nah, that's Kevin Bloody Wilson yeah that was Kevin same, yeah, same so one though the, but yeah he had the next the yeah Rod, Rodney Root the whole lot fuck that was the same dude Kevin yeah. Bloody Wilson put Kevin Bloody Wilson <laughs> hey Santa Claus you can't yeah. all that <laughs> fucking great <laughs> and as your kid you just think that is the fucking funniest thing you ever heard but most dudes don't grow up like that eh nah it's not it's not common especially nowadays it's definitely yeah. not common anymore how much of that shit like helps when you get to like the moto gp level like well, i think in shit? life in general i think yeah. it just gives you life skills you understand how to handle situations a lot better <laughs> like nothing's too much of a drama like yeah. like i said when i was uh, like like kids and pity and i used to go riding like you'd have a chain break in the middle of fucking bush and you'd sit there for two hours with fucking tire wire or you go and cut a bit off a fucked out fence that you found lying around somewhere yeah and why are you chained back up you know you learn how to problem solve i feel yeah. like you learn how to problem solve so much as a as a kid when you're submersed in, in that sort of situations yeah so you just nothing's ever too like i never get too flustered about anything you know <laughs> just like, oh well we'll fix it it is what it Literally is it is what it is we can't change it now no he's crying over spilled milk yeah because you definitely see guys that would be you know on the paddock and that you'd be racing that they just don't have never that, had that same experience. sort never. of experience never no exactly so it's 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 cool like they 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 got their own sort of thing and you know whatever they did you know that would have been special to them but fuck dude, i lived i had the greatest childhood i, I think <laughs> anyone could ever imagine like i was the ultimate like i wouldn't change it for anything yeah well it's funny though like because how many people like you said you started making proper money and you're just like yep giving it straight back to my parents you would have seen i've seen a lot you of would families. Have seen that shit get fucked up right oh for sure for sure um, so many so I'm, like the stories are endless the stories are endless but do you remember watching some of that stuff like oh i've seen it firsthand with did with you see it before you made money yeah, yeah and what how did that shit make you feel back then I was thinking, well, this is fucking weird. Like, it's just, in the end, it's just money. Like, yeah. I mean, fuck, money comes and goes, but your family is there forever. I mean, okay, I'd understand completely if your fucking oldies weren't, you know, if they were just sit, sort of sitting around mooching, not really wanting to do anything. But my dad's out fucking every day grinding, yeah. every day. And, you know, if I can help him, you know, if we've got a goal together that we want to obtain and fucking get everything back that we had before so yeah like it's not like he's sitting on his ass at home sort of just like waiting for you to do it yeah he's fucking out there grinding as well trying to do his thing you know he's got a a company in cambodia now they're starting up where they've got like six rigs over there now drilling like he's he's fucking grinding flat dude flat mm. so he but honestly i don't know I keep telling him he has to slow down because he's going to burn himself out. But I think if he did slow down, he'd go nuts. Yeah. Yeah, you do see that, eh? Like, the guys... Because Jats' dad's the same, man. Like, Pete is just a fucking animal, man. Just a workaholic. Just absolutely grinds, dude. And same as my dad. Like, my dad needs two fucking knee replacements. So he can barely get around. I seen him the other day, and then he's like, no, I had that, he reckons I had that jab on his knee, and now he's feeling all right. He was fucking straight back onto it. Yeah, but he wor he works in a brick factory, dude. He's fucking nearly 60 years old, and we're just like, hey, man, you, you should quit, eh? 
You could probably retire if you wanted, Dad. Just chill. <laughs> yeah, but just can't do it, eh? Nah, they, uh, he's on it. Worse for him. Worse for him. Yeah, like, I look at my that. pop. My pop, he still works now. Loves it. He, he tried quitting. Mm. He went nuts. So he's like, fuck that. I'm going back to work. When um when did you first um do, like, Phil? Do you remember the first time you did Phillip Island and, like, that feeling of being back in Australia? Was it weird to go... To be in Europe for so long, and then oh, like but I used home. to I used to come home like in the winters and yeah, stuff like okay. that. Like I'd, I'd always come back, but the first time racing in Phillip Island was nuts. Like the feeling of being home and actually getting to compete at you know the top level. Because that would have been like a bit of a. I'm assuming for every Aussie that does MotoGP, that would be like the holy grail to like do well there. Yeah, definitely. And I've been fortunate enough, you know, to to win the Moto Three there. And then, of course, this year to get the podium there was just fucking nuts. Like, it was better than anything I've ever imagined. That's and that so was just sick. a podium, dude. Like, yeah. You say just a podium, but I've worked my guts out to get the podium. So, yeah. I mean, it's massive for me. But uh, it, it it's nuts. It is. Like, it is. I can't even. It's indescribable. Yeah. Because it was that, that great of a feeling. Does Do you look at that race, though, like, as an Aussie, as, like, that's, like, the one you yeah, want to win? definitely definitely like i want to win as many as i can but for yeah. sure that one and i don't know what it is i'm, I'm i've been fortunate enough and uh, in my career that i'm i find an extra gear when i get home I, I just seem to love the track i love the vibe you know the stressful weekend you're doing shit here shit is there it, everywhere it it's, a, it's, it's a stressful weekend but i feel in that you got that extra power it sort of lifts you a little bit mm, as well yeah like you sort of got more energy because like I said, it. you just sort of feels like you're pulling extra gear and you're like, right, let's go. Yeah. What was it like to win on the Moto Moto 3 bike then? Unreal. Unreal. Uh, it was because I needed it right at that point in time. You know, I was fighting for the championship, which I ended up losing by two points. Oh, yeah, you did to Alex Marquez, Marquez right? yeah. And, uh, like, I won that. And um, it was like I found, like, I had a couple of bad races. Like, I fucked up in Japan on the last lap I was leading and, and I got jammed and got run wide and like four bikes got underneath me. Yeah. And it basically put the nail in my coffin and then it was sort of like like the championship was kind of done. I think I was down like 27 points and yeah. it was like three races to go. And I ended up clawing it back to two in Valencia. How was that? That was tough. <laughs> How was that to That's like? a fucking tough pill to swallow. Yeah. Especially when you go over the line, you won the race. Like I'd smoked them, absolutely destroyed them in Valencia. I was fucking around, slowing the group down. And then Rins, his team, Rins, his teammate at the time, ran me off the track. Like, I was pretty dirty, but I was clean. Like, I just kept running wide, trying to get as many bikes in between myself and him. Oh, yeah. Not dirty, but I just sort of, like, running wide. Down. Yeah, doing what you got to do. Rins mid-corner just cleaned me up, and then Vinales got a gap because we fucked around. Yeah. Like, in the last three laps, I had to chase down, like, three and a half seconds, and I chased him down and fucking caught him and passed him. And then I was like, there's nothing I can do now. I can't even fucking slow it down and bring a group back together and yeah. you know, see what happens. So I was like, fuck, you just got to go for it. So I won it. You go to the line. I knew what the what position I had to be in and what position he had to be in. He had to get fourth. And he got third. Uh, he had to get fourth for me to win the championship. Yeah. And he got third. Like, I went over the finish line. I'm like, fuck, yes, yeah. so I won. And I looked. And I was just seen third. And I'm like. And it's like someone just fucking put their hand down your throat and just root your heart out. It was really? Just, yeah. Like unreal unreal like happiness to immediately just fucking devastated you know the thing you've worked your whole life for and you just come up that short it was a tough really really tough pill to swallow and did you know that was going to be your last season in moto 3 yeah i'd already done all the contracts and everything like that for moto gp and like that's what i was thinking at the time was i'm going moto gp but i think i didn't deal with the the things at right at the time like um, what do you mean they say just like the letdown and stuff like that, I think I, I, I carried a bit of that baggage to mm. the next season. And hence the reason you know, I said I arrived a little overweight and there's that the other. I was kind of, wouldn't say depressed, but like just sort of fucking like let down at myself. Mm. Because I, I won the most races that year. I was fucking the strongest dude all year. The bike wasn't the strongest that year. But, you know, I rode really good and just came up two points short. Yeah. Two points and then you go back through and you look at all the races that, all the things you could have done could to get have done better points. fuck dude <laughs> fucking so many do you reckon though that you learnt off that yeah. a lot yeah it, it it made me it like put me down but then I feel it's just brought me to a whole nother level level where you don't let shit fluster you so much yeah in that sort of sense you know 
Do you have like people around you that you'd say are like mentors or like people you go to in those kind of like hard times or? Yeah. There's a few, like I got Aki and then Cal was really good for me as well. Cal Crosslow. He helped me sort of understand uh, things better and how to approach people in the paddock or how to be in the paddock and shit like that. Yeah. Because he was quite wild back in the day and just sort of explained a lot of things to me and made everything a lot clearer yeah. for me, I think. Were you too wild at, at times, you reckon? A little wild, yeah, when I was younger. Like, for sure, when I look back on that Moto3 season, I could have done shit a lot better. Yeah. A lot better. A lot more professional. Why do you think you were wild, like? Just young. 18. First time you ever got a bit of money in your pocket. Yeah. And on the other side of the world, you got no parents, nobody to tell you. No. Yeah. So. Dude, I struggled with that shit, and I was making, like, 60 grand a year <laughs> yeah. when I first moved to America, like, and I was a fucking idiot. Yeah. <laughs> I used to, like... Yeah, but I mean... Y- you were you you weren't an athlete i was meant to be yeah. an athlete and then i was trying to live this bucking both lifestyle i've seen it happen with the speedway boys and a few others you know that yeah you go to the other side of the world you you know i had parents sort of you, know, you have parents your whole life telling you what to do and then you're fucking yeah. 17 years old 18 years old nobody telling you no nobody telling you you can't do this gotta go to bed at this time now yeah. do whatever you want dude that was like it's like a free-for-all it's quite dangerous it's it's almost like a recipe for disaster it is for sure like i wish people would understand like the josh hill podcast he was on like i'm pretty he didn't say it but i'm pretty sure his first um his first like amateur contract was worth like five mil Hmm. and it's like why the fuck would you give a kid five million dollars like that's so dumb Hmm. i was making i think when i first went to america and i was working for jdr i probably made like I did some extra shit on the side. I probably made seventy grand US that that first year that I was there, and I would I used to do dumb shit like I'd fucking put a dent in my surfboard. Like some someone had like run into me surfing, and it'd like fuck my board. So instead of like going in, taking my wetsuit off, taking it to a ding repair shop, waiting a couple of days, get my board back. I just go and buy another fucking oh, thousand dollar surfboard. Like I'd stuck that in the back of the U. Yeah, I'd go so literally that one. buy the exact same fucking surfboard. Like just the dumbest shit that I used to do. And like we'd go to Vegas every three weeks. Mm. Like <laughs> every fucking See, I, three I weeks. I wouldn't do that. No, I, n- now I would have then, but I oh, know Vegas ain't a place for me. That's not a place for me. <laughs> have you been to Vegas before? When I was a kid with oh, my parents. So you haven't been there. Never as a grown been up. there as a grown up. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went there and I saw what happens in Vegas. Just as a kid, you know, walking down the street going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Don't need this in my life. And then I look at it and I'm like, you cannot be trusted in Vegas. You just <laughs> you just stay here. Like, Gold Coast is as far, uh, as close to Vegas as I'll go. Yeah, I was going to say, like, even, like, going to Goldie's even bad enough. Yeah, exactly. Or right. the wool shed on a Thursday night in Townsville. The wool shed? Yeah, they, the wool shed. They, oh, no, Mad Cow. Mad Cow. That's the one, that because they had one that was the same as Mad Cow. Yeah. Jeez. So that's the spot, Mad left side there, boy. Have you had some wild nights in Mad Cow? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I say to them, though. I'm, I get in enough trouble in Townsville. Like, yeah. I don't get into trouble, but... You can if you want. I can if I want. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like I get in trouble, but I get myself... Yeah. I'm happy. Yeah. A night in Townsville is enough for me. I don't need anything more. I don't need to go and spend fucking stupid amount of money because I'm not a good gambler. Yeah. I know that for a fact. I'd lose. <laughs> I'd never walk out up. <laughs> I'm that guy like oh, oh, I've made this I'm gonna double it and then if I win I'm gonna double it again until it's not there anymore you know it's just I'm not a good gambler so I don't want to put myself in that position oh uh, yeah Vegas, simple as that Vegas ain't the place though. it's not for me it's not for me Townsville's the place for me so with, with like the the MotoGP stuff now that like would you say that you feel solid that mm. it's like I'm, a, I'm, I'm a, solid I'm, I'm a like a career dude in, I'm in, a guy there now yeah. yeah and yeah. when did you start to feel that Probably halfway through my first year in Ducati. Yeah, okay. Because I, I, I had the results, but no one really trusted me because I was on Honda, but my Honda was like three years older than the one Mark was on win- winning. Yeah. And like, so people definitely just, not, they just put you in the same boat. They think like, oh, if he's winning on that, then you must be able to win on that as well. Exactly. And uh, so I was like, no, I'm, uh, you know. And I got the deal with Ducati, did that, and, and then I was like, fucking, you know what? Like, I, I am a boy. I'm like a guy here. I, yeah. I can take it to these guys. And then you sort of find an extra gear, and then you're like, nah. They're not as fucking crazy as, as you used to think, you know? They're not as stupidly talented or anything better than you are. And it was at that time that I started, you know, trying to really work more on the 
on the just looking at things positively yeah rather than looking at the, the negative side of shit so would you look at them say like you look at a like a rossi or a marquez or like those bigger dudes would you look at them back in the day like they had something different to you mm. yeah well not something different but i was thinking what the fuck are they doing different to me yeah what are they doing more more i didn't think i've always been the guy that they're like you know he's got talent so i never really question my mm. ability let's say it's just like what do i need to do what areas do i need to work on what do i need to focus on to try and become that dude like what is he doing differently and what did you think it was no just everything i look at pictures of of them on the bike what i'm on doing on the bike you know you start questioning how you ride the bike your style this that the other and in the end you just get comfortable on the bike and once you're comfortable that's the biggest thing when, yeah when you're comfortable you can fucking do amazing things how about you trust all, the bike how about all like the extra shit like around the the bike not not necessarily like the on the bike stuff but like what the data sh- and everything like that and it's a fucking nightmare that's the biggest that was the hardest thing for me to set up is like through the race weekend how to prepare the whole race weekend so that when you arrive in the race you're as ready as you can be to go with your maps with your you know yeah so what have you got to do to prepare for a MotoGP race everything like we start on friday and it's all about putting laps on the tires but then you got to try and be inside the top 10 so you've got two 40 minute sessions on friday yeah and then one in the morning on saturday yeah 40 minutes so in that time you are trying to set up the bike for the race to a track that you haven't been at in a year you need to be inside the top 10 and if it's going to piss down on fucking either sat friday arvo and then saturday morning it can still be patchy yeah so you got to do a fucking lap time at the end fp1 when the bike's not good and you got to throw tires at it and go hell for leather and try and get inside that top 10 so that you're immediately into the the q2 yeah it's like top 10 shootout sort of thing so it's like you're working on that but then at the same time you're trying to understand what the bike's doing what you need to change yeah how your electronics are working engine brake good here engine brake good there Powers so can you change the engine brake corner by bike? corner really mm-hmm. how do you do that they've got flaps in the exhaust they've got different things with the clutch there's so many different things they can do and so how also does it with firing order and stuff like that they can change it how does it change corner by corner with the gps are you serious mm-hmm. so your bike is different every corner mm-hmm not every corner but like, fuck so you're going to a fifth gear corner you don't want like or like a fast corner where you're rolling off you don't want the same engine brake as if you're trying to stop from you know 340 to 60k now really so like so you'll have when you're braking so like first corner like main straight 300 and then you're hitting the brakes to go into that turn your like your bike knows where the position that you're mm-hmm. on the track and yeah. it'll change so that you have more engine braking yeah what traction power everything and so is it's up to you to like tell them you what set you it, want yeah that seems like give you a, a nightmare, nightmare it's right. a fucking nightmare to get your head around like you gotta work it out and you sit down looking at fucking computers with squiggly lines on them all days <laughs> especially for me like i'm adhd I was gonna say, you're know, not you a squiggly line like, you're just a squiggly line yeah. bro. <laughs> <laughs> so trying to like do all that sort of shit is fucking like it's a mind, mind fuck especially at the start coming from moto 3 where it's just throttle it's and just brakes a, yeah. pretty much you got your lean angle and stuff like that but not, oh, you don't even have a lean angle you got like your your uh suspension graphs and stuff like that but that's about it so are there dudes that are good that are like that's the thing as well you gotta have a good crew around you a yeah. really good group like your data guy so the guy who's analyzing what you're doing the guy who's programming who's your electronic engineer and then a good crew chief a guy who can be in charge of those two plus the mechanics yeah so you need a whole package it's like not just the one thing it's like you need a good group of guys around you and so they all understand and like the biggest thing in team sport like that like because it becomes a team sport then yeah like massively and you don't want him saying yeah yeah, yeah like he understands when he fucking doesn't mm. you know and then because there this would be guy pressure here to putting say him that. in the check yeah like a rider comes in and fuck i feel like he's doing oh yeah 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 and they just say yeah yeah and you're like uh, no that's not how it is have you had that before oh yeah plenty of times and do you know that they're full of shit I didn't at the start because uh-huh. you try to give people the benefit of the doubt but then you understand hey this cunt doesn't understand <laughs> honestly you, you just sit there and you're like I'm fucking beating my head against the wall like help me really and how much difference can that make in like a lap time massive massive yeah. so it's like, like stupid like it's gnarly yeah especially and not only lap time for a single lap time race Over distance the right. yeah. and if you can prepare your maps that the bike is going to work from the start of the race to the end of the race when the tyres deteriorating everything like that 
So you need to take the power down less and less. But or you want to start it low and then at the end of the race try and bring it up that that, that you've got enough tire to make the race because you'll you'll burn through the through the tire. So they can cha- can they change it on the fly or is once the bike's on the line it's on the line? Once it, the bike's on the line it's on the line. Yeah, we don't have live data like the Formula One. I was going to say because Formula One they can change shit. Eh? They can change shit while they're driving. Yeah, we don't have that. So we are like now they just put in like sending messages, so they can send us messages like say if it starts raining and or or if it's wet and then it's going dry and someone's already put slicks on before it was all on pit board, but now they can at least send you a warning and say like. 93 faster like he's put slicks on and he's going faster than you are on the wets uh. and shit like that like and say if you're being followed or something like that but we never put the boys never tell me that or like if you're in the end of qualifying or whatever or you need time they'll put pit like come in the box now we need to like otherwise you're gonna have no time with the new tires so how does the um is that just in qualifying or in the race as well no you can have it in the race as well so did you swap bikes eh and they the can races? send like suggested map or the bike will the bike does some calculations itself as well while you're riding it really so i can understand how much fuel you're using and it'll like it knows how long the race is going to be and like for example i don't know if you saw the race where i turned the fucking thing off on the grid no. and i was fourth on the grid in thailand they <laughs> swap they swap some buttons around and like i roll up and like we've got this whole shot device we have to pull so and like it was a new one so i couldn't twist it too hard and then I'm like fucking a little bit flustered. Where's my grid position? Right on the grid position. Hot shot device is in. Fuck, okay. Launch control. And I just, like as soon as my hand went back on the handlebar, I immediately went like I go in the pit box and I fucking press the off button. Oh. Turn the cunt off. <laughs> Fuck. But then I did the whole race. Like I chased. I caught back up. I got like 13th or 12th. And I caught back up, but I did the whole race pushing by myself in Thailand, which is like a really, like it's a lot of straights. Yeah. So without the slipstream, you use so much more petrol. Mm. And like from fucking lap three or four, it worked out. Fuck, this gun's chewing way too much fuel. <laughs> so I was like 10 horsepower down for the rest of the race. Oh, so your bike just autos like No, like it. you got to change the map. But uh, I, I, when but the bike suggests you. me change fuel map, it uh, means like you need you need to do this. This is like obli- 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 You're obli- obligated. Obligated to do it. Yeah. And uh, so you got to do it. Otherwise, you won't fucking make the end of the race. <laughs> oh. And like, I think even I did, and it's fucking pretty good. Like, oh, I went slow on the warm down lap, and I think we had about 200 grams worth of fuel. Really? So, that dude, they're, so you're running some crazy data there. There's some nuts. It, it's like... So do you have to be a kind of guy that, like, enjoys the data side of it? Because no, to me, like... I don't enjoy that. I don't enjoy it. I'm don't you reckon it I don't sit you, down and fucking study it day in, day out. But don't, don't you reckon that would help you if you did? Some people, yes. Yeah, some people, no. I like to get the basics. My boys, what they do is, like, I just get them to print me out an overlay. So, of, like, we've got all the other Ducati, so the factory boys, everything. They yeah. print me out on two A4 pieces of paper, my lap and his best lap, overlaid like that. I'm in blue, he's in red. And I can see, okay, he's using more brake pressure here, or more lean angle, less spin, this, that, the other. But i got the two pieces of paper, and I can hold them in my hands, and I just yeah. you know, look through okay fuck yeah he's doing this he's you know picking the bike up a little earlier yeah and i can read all that off my paper but i like doing that because also when i look at the computer screen like trying to study my eyes are a bit shitty at that like especially for close range yeah and i just start fucking like tearing up and shit so i hate <laughs> looking at the computer screen i'd rather look at it on yeah. a4 paper yeah because i guess though you could say that it would and help. then but then i can take it back with me yeah to the motor home and as i'm sitting there and laying in bed whatever the night I have a look quick look through it yeah have a little bit more so that it's fresh in your mind when you go to bed so you're sort of thinking about it and what's so what sort of what sort of shit you can you learn just like yeah braking pressures just braking pressures like. lean angle how much power they're using also you can see how much their torque map is so how much power they're allowing to put through the bike ah uh, so you can have fucking your grip like that but if the bike's only programmed for 60 percent torque oh uh, so are you pretty much like full throttle all no, the time no, no, or no, no. so you're using you're it. managing it because if you're full throttle all the time everybody's going to be on the same fucking limit yeah but you can have it too much where it allows you to have too much and then you overspin so the best thing is like five percent spin is ideal yeah um it's like where you're getting the most amount of turn so you, cause uh, you try and turn because with it's the a rear. balance of like slide, slide and traction and drive yeah five yeah. percent around what you want to keep yeah so you yeah. just try and work at that number was there there was a race this year where you like pretty much just lost the rear right you were in third for a bit and then you like lost yeah. the tires well yeah we get that sometimes as well with being yeah. on a satellite bike um so what's the what's the, the difference tires, there sometimes tires just don't work 
Yeah, okay. So, so have you got different ties to the factory dudes? No, or? The, on paper they're the same, but every now and then you might get hit with, let's say, a pre heated tire, something yeah. that somebody else has put on a rim at another race, and then yeah, it'll it would have been through fucking six or seven heat cycles, pulled off the rim, put back in a container, sent to the other side of the world, yeah. and then you get it, and the fucking thing's not the same as a brand new one, uh, or even can come down to the ones that are sitting in top of the container. Yeah, so on the top, you know, roasted. they're stacked. They sat in Malaysia for fucking three or four weeks before we get there. Yeah. Just baking in the sun every day. So the top ones are going to be a little harder than the bottom. Uh, dude, it's, it's just crazy, luck of the draw. Crazy detail, eh? Where, what's the deal with the lean angle then? Like when you're studying the lean angle, what are you looking for there? Like the thing is you don't want to have too much lean angle all the time because you just wear out the edge of the tire. Yeah. So if he's able to like have less time on full lean angle, so he's using a different line, you can sort of understand that from that kind of thing. Ah. Uh. So if he's like, if I'm fucking full lean angle for a long time, it's like you're trying to go into the corner too early. Yeah. And you're having to hold a lot of lean angle, whereas he's prepping it, boom, use a little bit of turn from the rear and get the thing up off the edge as soon as possible. Yeah, right. How the fuck do you learn all this, man? Just time. So Just that's, takes time. That, so that really... But see, some of these Spanish kids are doing it since they're fucking... Since we were groms riding around the paddock in fucking Townsville, mm. you know, six, seven, you do it. It's unreal now. Fran- Franco's seen it first, and you've seen what those kids are like in Europe. There's kids walking around this big, elbows on the ground, head on the ground, everything. And you're like, fuck me. I'd only <laughs> dream of doing that when I was like 14, and you're doing it at this age. <laughs> so just like, where levels, are you going to be? Eh? Yeah, it's just different cultures. Did buy an and around the paddock. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but that teaches me to be like Ken Block. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, it's so gnarly, like the nuances when you break it down, like the tiny, tiny levels at which you can gain just fractions here, tents there, saving some tires, saving some fuel, more power. Like, it just seems like endless the amount of oh, shit. Oh, it is, it is, it is. And you never get a perfect setting. It's always something you can change. Mm. So, so it's like, just making a compromise. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking, I'm like, Man, what what would it be like if you like really? Because I'm a fucking nerd. The reason I do good at jujitsu is I just I fucking I was like a you white like studying. Belt. Yeah. yeah, I was a white belt that could, I was like, oh, I know fucking so much shit about jujitsu, and mm. I talk to other people, and they're just like they're not on the same level yeah. of like understanding Their belt might the be game. Higher, but they're not. Yeah, right. But but then it's like but physically to do it is so different because it's that, and I know that now like you can't study time like you can put in time I don't, study, I, but the bike time really is so different down. i hate sitting that's my one thing i hate doing is sitting down and fucking looking at lines all day i can't do it like i said i just get my paper and that's enough I, and i like even like i just had to change my guy and i have to explain to my new guy's good but i have to explain to him like i, I just want throttle traction like how much uh spin i've got lean angle back pressure front and rear suspension and then that's about it you yeah. know and speed you see your speeds and that's that's it can you get like can you get a lot faster over a weekend yeah or? well you do and the track's always getting better as well so just because there's more rubber more, down. more rubber more it's becoming cleaner yeah yeah so like it always is like that boy but then on sunday the track for the race is always different so we always have to soften like before race because all weekend it goes moto three moto two uh moto three moto gp moto two and yeah. then generally on sunday it goes moto three moto two moto gp and the moto twos go out there and they're on dunlop as well as the moto three but the moto three don't leave any rubber or take any yeah but the dunlops basically sweep the track clean of any rubber so really? the track for sundays always slippery very low grip especially in the first probably quarter of the race and then that means you got to soften the bike to try and get try more traction. And allow yeah to get some grip yeah so the dudes like like um lorenzo and valentino and those dudes are they is there any guys that are in the pits because I, I really i'm fucking motor gp retarded like i don't know that much shit about it but are there guys in the pits where it's like yeah they're like full gnarly data dudes like they're valet, super valet is a, he's i think well from what i gather and from what i've heard i don't know because i'm not in the box with them yeah but they like to like Valentino. I know my Pecco, Pecco my teammate uh, yeah. Francesco Bagnaia. They like to sit down and look at the lines, but doesn't interest <laughs> the me. The squiggly lines, I fucking love it. Hey, <laughs> you're just out there on fucking podiums and shit talking about squiggly lines. Got, got my paper. I just get my A4 <laughs> bit of paper and I'm good. 
Like, but I get enough information out of that. I can see. And you're only limited. You there's only you can just lose yourself if you start looking yeah. at it too deep. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah, I so can see. I just see need that. to know the bare basics. I'm not a fucking engineer. I know mm. that. I'm I've no qualms. I'm not a guy who builds bikes. I'm a guy who rides bikes. Yeah. I don't I don't want to be a setup. I don't want to tell you what you need to build. Yeah. I will tell you what the bike's doing and what I feel it needs to do. Yeah. That's it. I'm not there trying to re fucking invent the wheel. Yeah. Because that's not my position. Yeah. This guy's been in university and done everything that fucking he knows how to set that up. Yeah. That's why it's hard to to know because most of these guys have been, but some you can just work with and some you can't. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. So do people know what you're doing for next year yet? Next year's just the same thing. So you're on Primax. Primax, same thing, but on the twenty one bike uh twenty bike. Yeah. Fuck, I'm starting to lose dates know, here, eh? Yeah, it's, Fuck, it's bad this time of year. <laughs> it is, eh? But, uh, yeah, on the 20 bikes, on the latest model bike, and... Uh, it, so, were you not on the latest model bike No, this I was year? this year. Yeah, okay. So, same thing. Yeah. But really took me to mid-year to sort of understand, and then also with the new development parts and stuff like that. So, the, the 2020 bike looks awesome. I got to ride on it one day in Valencia, and it feels good. I'll try it again in Sepang. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, um, I did a one-year contract, my, my own choice, because the last two contracts I've done... I've been stuck between a rock and a hard place and where I can go because mm. I haven't been synced up with everybody. There's been like three rides. Yeah. One or two you don't want. So uh. I just did a one year contract, try and sync up with it. Ev- well, sync up with yeah. everybody else and then yeah. we'll see. Yeah. And like, so ultimately, like, because you're still super young, like you can be That's in the, the biggest thing. Like I've been here for a while and like, it's crazy. I feel like a, one of the older dudes, but yeah. I'm fucking still one of the younger ones in the, on the field. Yeah. So like how much thought are you putting into the, into the future? Because you can be, just chuck on the floor. Yeah. Um, Cause you can be in the sport for so long. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I look at guys like Valentino, but I don't want to be there till I'm 40. Yeah. I was going to say like, what what's like good for you? Like, what do you want? I'll be do? happy if I can race till I'm 30 maybe some more you know i fucking love riding motorbikes but i'd like to go and do something different yeah what would you do different don't know think something like that (laughs) thinks on my bucket list for sure dude i'll do think with you when you do it because i'm sort of kind of want my dad did think dad did think on a husberg 650 but fucking he was like he was like real man like i think he was 46 years old he had no tendons in his knee he went to sleep in the van on the way out there with his knee up, like leg up flat on the van. Fuck. Couldn't even fucking walk to go to sign on. His knee blew up that big. He rode it. He was going good. And I think, he, what did he end up coming? 130th? That's all right. 600 Overall. dudes. Mm-hmm. But he crashed right as you come into the last bit, right in the stadium. They watered the clay there. Oh, yeah. I know exactly what you're Lost about. the front. Oh, fucking a little bit fast, another 40 dude. dudes passed like he was <laughs> going to yeah if it was KO I don't remember signing off or anything wow <laughs> and the worst thing was he borrowed my nice TLD helmet and fucking destroyed it <laughs> he paid for it but you made him pay for it yeah no no like, he paid for it like it was he, he bought it for oh, me okay, but I'll he's like yeah that. I'll use your helmet like we'd been to America for a holiday <laughs> and like that was the thing we did when we were kids like you get a helmet out of America it's always going oh, to be way yeah. cooler than you get anything anything back here in Oz so yeah. I had a sick TLD day in the dirt one I and, do remember uh, those things and uh, yeah he wrote it off for the Fink but, uh, but yeah, oh, that's so definitely on the bucket list the Cape Trip Cape do trips. you reckon you could do it in 21? depends when we do it when when would work? I feel like we could December. schedule it have to be December. Fuck, that'll be hot. It'll be hot. <laughs> yeah, but you're on a bike, so it's not bad. You're yeah, in the wind. Dude, it was hot. Like, every time we stopped. Dude, I, I come from up, like, yeah, halfway well, up. You, you know. I come from halfway you up, know. and I tell you, fucking putting in sprinklers yesterday, it was fucking hot. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, you know it's hot when you're bending down, and it's just fucking a stream running off oh. the bridge of your nose. You're like, oh, it's warm. Dude, I, I trained on Monday for, because I've been off training pretty much, like, with all the supercrosses Super and all everything the bullshit like that, yeah. having trained I went back there on Monday and I was just like we had to gee on like the big fucking pajamas that you gotta wear mm. and I was got up full dizzy wanted to spew spins, I couldn't even yeah. get my mouth guard out <laughs> I'm just like what are we doing here boys why like, are we here let's take, let's take the fucking yeah, it's been hot here as well though, yeah. this week it was like, like 38 f- the other day dude and still trying to train he said down in South Australia, what was it? Yes, say 46? Yeah, they got like gnarly heat 49. waves. 49. Eh? <laughs> oh, Fuck that. Global warming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Must be happening. Um, so, what, yeah, so you They're not the polar ice caps. Don't they have like more ice on them now than ever? I don't know, man. I don't fucking look into it. Me order. neither. I mean, I, if it happens, it happens. What are we going to do? <laughs> you know, know what I mean? Stop fucking, stop driving. Exactly. Cars. 
just chill and start fucking cruising. Yeah, but that volcano erupted the other. That's fucking thirty years worth of man-made emissions right there, bang in the atmosphere. Yeah, true. I'm sure, eh? we'll be fine. <laughs> Jack Miller dropping that knowledge, son. Yeah, we'll be right. <laughs> so, yeah, you reckon what? What do you? What can you see for your MotoGP career? Like visualizing the future. Hey, I want. I want to try and be champion. You know, a lot of people say it, but I feel. I feel I can do it if I keep the right attitude and keep doing what I'm doing and just keep progressing every year. I'm yeah. getting better and better. And I feel, you know, I can challenge for wins or, or, or maybe even a championship. You know, it's such a hard thing to do. Oh, it's yeah. a long thing over, you know, now 20 races, it's oh, going to be hard. Crazy, so. eh? But that's the main goal. And then, yeah, retire back to beautiful old Townsville, pick races that I'd like to do. Fuck around, I'll find something else to do. <laughs> I just I love won't, like I won't stop. won't stop doing shit, that's for sure. On. I just love, like, some people, money changes them. And money and fame and all that. You just, you genuinely don't give a fuck. Like, there's, I, I don't know that I've met, I've met a lot of fucking people. I don't know that I've met anyone that's on your level of not giving a fuck <laughs> about all of the bullshit that comes with being. Like, you're one of the baddest dudes in the world. On a, on a two-wheeled thing, you're one of the baddest dudes in the world and you get paid fucking well to do it. And it's like, it just hasn't genuinely, like... Oh, so many people it. say thank you that's, that means a lot but but ah. so many people say oh it doesn't really affect me and I don't really think you are, it actually doesn't fucking affect you like well I just built my dream house and my dream house is a shed my shed's bigger than my house I showed you last night yeah, it's I so on the cool. Facebook it's bigger than my house because that's what I like I like having a big shed I like to tinker go and sit in the shed and tinker was, as soon as I like we put the roof inside on it the other day and I'm like, man, I'm going to build so much cool shit in here. <laughs> and it won't be cool shit. It'll be shit like AUs and stuff like that. It's not fun stuff, but I mean, fun to us. Yeah. I get a kick out of it. So like being like that dude though, what keeps you like, is it hard to go through like, cause it's serious shit. Like it's a serious thing. It's big money. It's big pressure. It's oh, big so, companies. You know, you got massive companies on your back and like you do have to, when it's crunch time, you got to work. Yeah. You gotta work. So, like the last couple of years, I go do, have my fun in Australia. I keep cycling, and I cycle to the coffee shop nearly every morning. You know, from home down to the beach, I go. It's like fifty k each way. Ah, fifty k. Yeah. Well, fifty five there and back. I tell mum and dad at sixty. Then <laughs> dad's not on me back because he's still on my back now. You cycled this morning. <laughs> Not today, Dad. I'm having a week off. Just relax. <laughs> I'm right? having beers at two yes, every day. <laughs> exactly, Peter. I am having a beer. It is far too hot. <laughs> but like, like the last couple of years, I'm going out again to America and going train. I trained the last like three years with. Uh, oh, you were w- training with Woody and Osho, Osho yeah. those boys, and Peter Adderton from Boost. Yeah, they've been unreal. Like bunch and Johnny Lash, they're all just legends out there. They look <laughs> after the big man, Johnny, man. the big tree, but, <laughs> the uh, big tree himself. But uh, no, they all look after me, and like I love going out there. And so that shit breaks. And they are up. gnarly. They are gnarly dudes. Yeah, they like. do train hard. So I go out there, and and also it's good for me because I know what level they're on because they are fucking consistent. They're yeah. the same every day. Yeah, they will be because they recycle every day. Yeah, and they're at that age where they're not still going better. They're just maintaining. Yeah, know, they're at the same peak. Yeah. So the first couple of days you get there, you're struggling a bit to follow with them, and then at the end of it, start to push them a little bit. Yeah. Ward is an animal. He'll he will die before he lets you beat him. <laughs> no way, darling. And um, but uh, no, I mean, so I go out there and it's like a good like thing to do. Like a bit I of a boot it. camp sort of deal. I do it just before I go to the first test. So I go direct from there to the first test, and I know I'm ready then when I get to the first test. Because how fit do you have to be on those bikes? Quite fit. The fucking things that cook you. They're yeah, so really? hot, especially in places like Malaysia and Thailand. Mm. So the heat's just the a heat's huge factor. a massive factor. The bike's heavy as fuck. The brakes, like I mean you. Carbon brakes, they try and flip you over the fucking handlebars. It's really? not, not, oh, it's fucking the amount of strength. Like, honestly, I'm losing weight at the minute. Like, I sit around, I sit around like 68, 69 most of the season. I'm losing weight at the minute because my, as soon as I stop riding, my shoulders yeah, shrink, yeah. my arms shrink, everything's, so the chest starts shrinking. So yeah, right. You get to the first race or so first those test of the season. That good. Yeah, they are fucking it's unreal. A, a, unreal. It's not normal how much power they have and how much stopping power because you got the grip there, you got the weight over the rear. It's kind of they're kind of just like the fastest car ever. They are, but you just you ride them instead they of are. driving. Well, they're just fucking a rocket ship. Like we're going up. We got more than three hundred horsepower. We are sitting on a bit like they they don't give you an exact number, but I know we're around like three twenty now horsepower. Is it crazy to think? Because this is what blew my mind on the Cape trip. Like I'm I'm not. I'll tell everybody I'm not a fucking fast rider. I don't want to go super fast. But that the thing uh, the Cape trip. By the end of it, I'm just like on the stop, just fucking on the valves. Yeah. But 
just not even thinking about it is it scary to you like how fucking fast you go and how normal it you feels? don't you don't notice it until it goes wrong really yeah i don't know if you've seen the one have you seen the, my crash in the mine no nah. have you got youtube yeah what do i type in jack miller crash just try, search jack miller crash dude uh, then i'll show you what going wrong is It will be. It went viral. It did. It does every year around the same time. <laughs> oh, yeah, we go. Give us a look. Yeah, it says it here, bro. Come on. So oh, I, where the fuck were you going? Oh. I got up and rode. Not even 10 minutes after that. I had to go out for qualifying. Fuck. Dude, actually, I remember seeing that. It went everywhere. I remember that. It helmet. went everywhere. But basically, they, I think they played in slow-mo after. Oh, after. So what happened? Did your foot so come I was off trying, the inside? No, I was trying to use a, a harder front tire. It was a little chilly. Yeah. And just like the last couple of corners aren't that that side of the tire. And then I grabbed the brakes mid-corner first took turn. Like you literally go in there six gear flat and then you grab the brakes as you're on the angle. And yeah. Went, just lost tucked. the front. And then I fucking thought I was crashing. So you basically let go. And then the country grab. grab oh. Grab. There you go. And then the thing that saved oh, my life here. The thing that saved my life here is the lump in the grass. Kicked the ass up. Because I was only looking at that wall. I didn't even know there was another wall. Oh, wow, dude. Look at the thing here. The lump in the grass what saved my life, Ready? Bang. So how did that save you? Because it just it kicked whipped you me so much. into that wall and then I could at least fucking rail the wall instead of hitting it because that was fucking like right there. If I'd hit that straight on, I was dead. Yeah, so you then would I have just straight in I the I tumbled fence. into this wall here. Bang. You watch me hit it. Bang. Oh. And a bike got me as well at the end there. Fucking bits of the bike hit me so like so that it was, just that was probably the scariest one like it, I didn't even I did my hand that was it really that one there my hand that was it and do you remember what was going through your mind at that point <laughs> like I'm dead pretty much like I was like fuck this is not good so it just as soon as it went and like you instantly focus on that wall you're like holy fuck that's close this is not gonna be good and like you're just trying to turn it but you got slicks on grass it's not it's not a good feeling so how like so is that the moment where it feels like you're going that's super when it fast. feels like you're going real fast really when you're gonna try and stop and you're going that fast when you're not on the asphalt or you're not on the bike anymore so that wall would look like it's come like instantly right instantly. there fuck that's scary that, that's that. how you know when you're getting fast when shit starts to go wrong that's when you know you're going wrong is that your wor- is that your worst crash you've ever had or just the scariest? That was the scariest one. The world. I've had fucking, dude, back and legs and fucking everything. Generally, like, the last injuries have all been outside of MotoGP, though. Yeah. Like, the one I was telling you after Tanley. Last one was on a trials bike at home, fucking around. <laughs> like, right before Japan, I had to miss Japan. Literally, I lost the front on grass. Just put my leg out to stop it from, like, walking pace. Yeah. But my leg just jarred and fucking split my tib- tibia down the front. <laughs> Oh, that's that one there. So I still got the steel in there. I need to get that out. Oh, then we go to collarbone, collarbones. They both. That one there. That one there. The elbow that was Black River Supercross. What'd you do there? What's his name? That was I think Joel Dinsdale landed on me. That was that oh, one. Oh really? That was that one. And then it was getting good. And me and Pity were fucking running home. Literally had like a week left with the wires in my arm because that wires holding the whole humerus together. Wow. And I was fucking around where the grader had been down the road. I was riding my bike and literally I just wasn't that tall on 85 and I went to do a U-bolt and the fucking front wheel hooked like the edge where the grader had been yeah. and just went that way. Yeah. I just fell over, walking pace and fucking rebent it all like a banana. Oh. Had to go back to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> That's too many. Yeah, no. Nah, too fine. many. It's not fun. Dude, that black, good at it. that black river stadium, man, like I remember, I remember crashing there one year and it, it was like the fence was so close to the track well yeah i i i, I hit the cunt one yeah. yeah my bike hit it and i ended up bailing it was off the it. one that the like the the rodeo fence too it was like yeah, yeah solid the rodeo steel fence. Yeah. fence like it was not like flexy at all it was <laughs> you hit it and go <laughs> I, I, my back wheel went like up off the side of a jump like just got kicked off so i bailed and there was a huge puddle on the outside of it i remember landing like in, in knee slop. deep worth of slop my fucking bike just smashed the fence hey i remember thinking like why is this fucking thing so close why is that? yeah they used to squeeze it in there that's for sure i had a big one there one year I've, like it was a double for step on step off and i sort of landed a little bit wheel high on the double <laughs> feet came off the back and just whiskied 
into the step on step off and like launch from one side to the other but like mid flight i had no legs on the bike mid flight i had to let go it was <laughs> not a good experience <laughs> i pretty much left there every year and i remember the one year i went there me and jats battled and then jats had a race at his place the like weekend after or something pete, yeah i remember that and pete said like because me and jats were like having a pretty decent battle in, in yeah. black river and pete's like yeah you need to come up need to come up and went up to his place like i made it through like the first year i made it through black river and i went to his place and fucking wrote myself off there instead dude what what <laughs> jump was that on i can't even remember to be honest like me and pity went up there and i can't even remember what fucking what jump it was but i remember leaving there in a fair bit of pain didn't go to the hospital though oh yeah that never took me i never went to the hospital <laughs> like when we were out of out of town <laughs> <laughs> he's just going we're fucking driving over. remember when they remember, do you remember when kdm did that uh kdm cup yeah. years ago yeah down in they did it here and fucking um it was at Coolum, wasn't it nope at uh oh reedy creek reedy creek yeah 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 i do remember that reedy creek and first race i went good second race me and wade got tied up i was gonna say wade one. was the man oh didn't wade win that year no nah, because me and him got tied up in turn one in the second race and like he had to win the overall and he didn't win the overall yeah he did win it one year though yeah, because he, he probably raced the next world, year yeah he raced world minis and then Matt Hunter went over and raced the B class, his brother, oh, yeah? and he won the B class. Oh shit! Year. Yeah, yeah. Matt, and uh, he had yeah. a fucking good style. Eh? I left there. I don't know if you remember Reedy Creek, but there was two yeah. tabletops in a row. Yeah. Before the hundred footer, and I landed from one tra- like pissed off, got up, what? just sent it, sent it, landed on the face of the second one, just blew my leg to pieces, like four tip and fib in four places. <laughs> And dad literally, I remember, picked me up. Well, we went, oh, they had the little medical block there. And he's like, yeah, no, nah, you'll be right. And I was like, yeah, I'll be right. And dad took me back to the motor home. He's like, right, I'm going to watch Hayden's last race. And then we'll go. And I'm like, this is no word of a lie. <laughs> like, you could even ask like Jake Wright and those guys because they were down on the fucking start line. <laughs> I got my boot back on. We were parked on a bit of a hill, pushed out of my bike off the fucking hill. Rolled down, I'm sitting there idling, had to peg on the bars, and everything, just idling at the at the start gates, waiting to go for the waiting to go out like there was uh, another bikes on the line, but we had the pegs already. And the old man come up to me and goes, What are you doing? Well, I'm Racing. <laughs> he goes, Hey uh. <laughs> Yeah, and he just put his hand on the kill switch and turned the bike on. He goes, You wanna race, you start the bike. I said, Yep, right on. <laughs> kicked it one time and I was like fuck it didn't start so kicked the second time it started but I collapsed on handlebars eh? like, really like, he's like yeah back to the car mate oh that's <laughs> put in the car went home got home Monday and mum's like ah I'll take you tomorrow to the hospital I'm like yeah right I go to the hospital tomorrow nah need an operation some of the bones have started setting in the wrong spot so oh. we need to pull them <laughs> Nightmares like that, dude. It's a long drive with a broken leg. I tell you, that's like Maddie broke his leg at Hatter, and they were like, um, "Not going to hospital out here." Oh well, they they said to him, "He's like, oh, I'm pretty sure I broke my leg, eh?" And then they're like, "Nah, nah, I reckon you'd be in more pain." And Matt's like, "All right, whatever." Mm. And then they're like, "You could have done your ACL." He's, Matt's like, "No, nah, I'm in pain. Like it fucking hurts. Like, I know I'm what I'm my done. leg. Yeah." And then they're you like, get that they're sharp doing that spike up your fucking oh, yeah. up your thing. They're doing the ACL test on his leg. And then the poor cunt he drove. Dad's like, just said the same thing. He's like, because that, that's the shit thing. Like, even at Adelaide. At least like, if you get home, you get home. Fucking yeah. Right, you know, dad or well, mum can come and help you. Yeah. Dad can go back to work. Well, we learned that lesson because Matty had to stay in Townsville for 10 days when he did his that kidney. Oh, it was so shit. But yeah, dad's like, look, we'll just get home. So yeah, Matty had to drive home from. Yeah, from I mean, Hatter. kidney's kind of a one that you do <laughs> I reckon you'd have to probably go to the hospital but leg you can muscle through it Wait, when when I had my kidney go down it, I was in Clipsal because I got like crazy sick really like, oh I was fucked I, I elbowed my ribs snowboarding like I was in Lake Tahoe mm-hmm. in the States mm-hmm. this old this old lady fuck it was funny she looked like a pink Power Ranger bro she was like this like probably 50 year old dressed up in a little puff oh puff puffy gear. pink shit the whole head to toe and I was coming out of the trees off there's like a, a road sort of thing and I jumped off the road and then down onto like the ski slope and I was hooking out of this thing and come down jump the road and as, as soon as I was in the air I saw her get up and then she was like oh like couldn't really stop and I'm just going I uh-huh. am going to fucking plow this chick so bad and then I've like I just sort of tried to turn in the air but I just got real off balance and I landed like with my no front first. front edge nah like 
just too like not enough edge to bite into the snow mm. and it just went out from under me and I, I curled up like that and basically just belly flopped onto the snow elbowed myself in the ribs i lost everybody I, I didn't know where anyone was i had to get all the way down the mountain got down there laid in the back of my truck and i was fucked like it was bad went home that night pissing blood spewing blood and then my buddy Wes is like we gotta take you to the hospital dude and I was like do not fucking take me to the not hospital in not in America dude I'm like, not going to hospital here I was like man I'm a fuckwit if I die I'm not leaving my parents with like a million dollar hospital bill like this ain't worth it we ain't got that kind of money I'm so not the, doing that to Pete no nah, I was like shaking and shit like I was in so much pain Give anyway long, pain. long story short I ended up I got better. Like I got like the next day I sort of woke up and I, I was like, I'm all right. I wasn't good, but I felt all right. And then I was like, nah, I'm sweet. I drove all the way home from Tahoe back to California. And then I had like these few Red Bull gigs that I was like, didn't want to miss out on. And um, so then anyway, worked for a bit. Get, and then by the time I was like ready to go back to Oz, I was fucked. Like I was yellow, dude. Like I was <laughs> kidney failure, <laughs> full just... kidney failure. So anyway, I get back to Australia. I come back looking like a fucking Simpson. <laughs> <laughs> There's a photo, bro. Because all, all I, I was mad in the golf, and uh, me and Jeremy Malot, we planned. We used to go to um to Scottsdale every year mm-hmm. for the golf. Arizona, yeah, yeah, yeah. And like we'd go hang out with Ricky, and then we'd go to the Ricky had always come to the Supercross, and we'd go to the golf. Ricky with Fowler. Him, Fowler, yeah. yeah. I remember the first one I went to. He was in the Red Bull suite. Yeah, he's a fucking G, bro. Unreal. Yeah, he is like, and he's he's like you, like full moto kid, and then he's he went a off. really nice guy. Yeah, fuck yeah. So I was like hanging. I was like, I'll go home right after Scottsdale and uh because like we just had the most fun that was still to this day actually even though i was sick as fuck that was one of the funnest weekends of my life and um anyway go home barely got on the plane bro i took like two xanax to get on the plane <laughs> double was, dropping xanis yeah double dropping xanis bro and then the the funny thing the chick or well, not that funny but the chick's like i don't know how you got home so anyway how, I, did, how did your kidney not explode on the fucking plane oh bro so i get I land and then I was like, oh, actually, I feel I'd have days where I'd feel good and not good. <laughs> and then um, when I got home, I felt all right. And then this was like when Maddie was sort of really getting into the V8 thing. And he's like, oh, can you come fly in and shoot some photos for me and help me out for Clipsal? And um, I was like, yep, sweet. Got on the plane to fucking Clipsal. I still didn't have an Aussie number or nothing. And um, get off the plane. Every cunt is freaking out. And um, they're like, because I went and got some blood tests done the day I landed. Oh, so no one could get a hold of you nah. and say, your fucking kidney's done. Oh, yeah. So I get to the race and then I'm like hanging out with Maddie and Troy Brosnan. Anyway, 10 minutes from being at the track, Ma, uh, the, the fucking doctor calls Maddie's phone and I just see Maddie like, his face just go like, what? And they're like, you need to get your brother to the, like get an ambulance for your brother right now. He could fucking die at any minute. Like he's not good. And I felt fucked. Like, like, I didn't feel that good at all. And, uh, that is a stitch up. Oh, and then I just met Troy Brosnan. And, like, two minutes into meeting this cunt, man, he's just like, Troy, we got to get Jace to the hospital. Troy's freaking out. And um, anyway, I just said, look, I'll oh, fuck it. I'll just get a cab. <laughs> so I get a cab to the Adelaide hospital. And this cabbie's in this cab telling me how shit his day was. <laughs> and I'm just sitting in there laughing like. I'm fucking better to die like, I could die on you. I'm like, you got no idea, bro. And you just think, oh, meanwhile, all you're thinking is, at least I'm in Australia. I'm not going to get a fucking million dollar bill. Oh, yeah. So anyway, I, had to, I got stuck in Adelaide hospital for like 12 days. They wouldn't let me go. I had an operation there to try and mm. I'd end I never knew I only had one kidney so I've been running on one my whole life bullshit yeah born with one fucking kidney so the fucking got stitched up heavy there heavy dude so I just they rip you off yeah big time get a fuck refund or Pete man shit Pete. is gonna, <laughs> but yeah so get a refund on that but yeah I got stuck in Adelaide for 10 I had to check myself out because I was going fucking mental bro like I just couldn't deal with it eh and then mum yeah it's nuts dude yeah mum ended up flying down for a couple of days and then but the problem was is my blood pressure wouldn't go down so they just like, stayed up yeah and I was on like I had like a crash cart and shit like one of the nights I just fucked out <laughs> like I come out of surgery and I was in I was in like the I remember waking up in like the post-op thing and then I just started shaking like out of control like I was freezing to death but I was sweating 
and the ladies. How bad like, do you feel in that when you come out of that post op though? Oh, that was the worst I've ever felt because I legit just thought Those I was gonna post die. Post off a fucking the, the last one I had like it's shit getting uh, operations in other countries and when they did that fucking one on my ankle because it was that fucked. Did you get that operator on in America? Uh, no, in Spain. Oh, I get pretty yeah. much all of them done in Spain. They've got a really good doctor there, but the oh, nurses listen. and shit are all the nurses and shit are all speak Spanish. Don't really speak English. So you never learn the language? No, I get I get by. Yeah, okay. With a little help from my friends, I dabble. <laughs> but uh, I was there, and like they had to put so much uh, metal and shit in. So what they did was they put an epidural in, in my your back, back. In my back. Fuck. But I come out. And, like, they didn't tell me they were putting epidural and nothing. I come out, I'm seedy as shit, and, like, it's freezing. I mean, Baltic. I'm there fucking, like you say, shaking. And, like, probably just having withdrawals from all the shit that they just yeah, put through. Yeah, true, eh? Hey. And they're like, um, the lady comes up to me, you can go upstairs when you can move your move your toes. What were your toes? And I'm like, all right, I'll just fucking do it easy enough, yeah. yeah. And I'm like... <laughs> And my fucking legs wouldn't move. Neither one. I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? Why? And I didn't know I had an epidural in. I did, never even had an epidural before. I'm like sitting You've there never going, been pregnant? My legs are fucked. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even move my feet. I said, what have they done? <laughs> They've gone for an operation on my ankle. They fucked me back. And I'm there like trying to, my good fucking leg. I'm like lifting it up and it won't stay up. And I'm like, what is this? Next minute they come and they're like, oh no. And I said, I can't move. No, no, you got happy doing. <laughs> I said, well, she told me I've been here fucking panicking for the last half hour trying to move my feet, <laughs> and you were telling me I got happy doing in my back. There's like a blockage. I can't do anything. Oh, yep. dude, this is the worst. Those rooms, I hate them. Your throat's always just fucking Drying, red raw yeah. too. They just been jamming those pipes down your throat. <clears throat> Fuck. Well, this thing that my blood pressure was like. 248 or something like retarded and then i'm on all these like blood pressure meds to like get it down and then they're like yeah we can't give you anything else and the lady's like you're gonna have to calm down relax and i was like man the only thing that's making me not calm is you in my fucking face like leave me alone like just let me me put some music on or something but yeah and then like just got worse and worse and i felt calm like that was the weird thing as i i was all right with it and I was just shaking, dude. Like, they had to hold me on the bed. Just like, because I was, I was about to have a stroke. Yeah. So, yeah, then they ended up, they took me, I got it under control. They have to sedate you or not? Yeah, so in the end, so I got it under control in the post-op. And then I just did, like, heaps of breathing and shit. I was just, like, trying everything I could just to, like, Bring your figure it down, out. Yeah. Down. And, um, and then uh, they ended up taking me up to the post-op room. And then um, as soon as, uh, sorry, into my own room again. And then as soon as I got up there, man, like it, just, I just went again, bro. Like just fucking legs are going everywhere. At least they weren't there. Oh, mum was freaking out, man. Mum like runs out into the hallway. And the worst thing is my business partner in America. I was just called my mum like, oh, how's Jace? Like after the operation, she's like, yeah, he's good. And then like, and then I just start losing it. And then she's like, fuck, he's not good. And like she drops the phone and like, no, nah, leaves it on. And so my business partner's in fucking America, man, on the phone, just like hearing all this commotion, like the like you're gonna have to get out liz and all this shit to mum and mum's like thinking i'm gonna die i'm thinking i'm gonna die and i just remember laying back going fuck this like I was, I'm off it. I was over it eh? i am off it <laughs> and then they end up oh, they, they end oh up well you don't have to have dialysis or anything like that do you? no nah, it'd come back good man perfect they said i'd be on blood pressure medication my whole life and i took it for like four weeks and then i was like sorted itself out i was like yeah fuck this we'll figure it out sorted her just like you jack you'll mate, figure it out just fuck it we'll work it out <laughs> cross well, that bridge well mate we just did three hours brother all right i oh, appreciate the shit Thanks out of you me. I f- yeah i really appreciate you coming on good times go downstairs eh should we go carry on <laughs> like pork chop well, second hand whippersnipper <laughs> well done jack yeah. well, i enjoyed your podcast and uh, thanks let's, mate let's go and we'll have to do this again whenever you want i think right, i think we've got a few trips coming up yeah. actually we might we'll, you might turn into we'll get some, get some content we'll get some content going you might turn into like the actual rider version of sam moore because sam's like my recap dude for yeah. like every event you might be like the, you might be he's the like new recap he's like dude. your rider at the minute but it, you know it's sammy we yeah. can't we can't say too much yeah you're, nah, awesome you're gonna be the you're gonna be the event recap dude from now on for well, i can tell you shit. i can tell you the good shit of, of the events i find the good places adam <laughs> i'm like sam that's why me and sam get along like i met him at supercross and i was like you are now like we just it was like the stepbrothers <laughs> we just become best friends like <laughs> man you we can get into places we got some places uh, just just talk your way in dude uh, red bull hat on in the monster suite hey how you going <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, just go. <laughs> we just did lappies. It was great. Uh, all right, let's go get in right, trouble. Cheers. <laughs> Fuck yeah, bro. Thanks, Eve. Say. Oh, actually, say that.